The next item of business is a statement by Michael Matheson on the Scottish Government response to the Infant Cremation Commission. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Michael Matheson, Minister. Uh, President Officer, I start today with a recognition, a recognition that there can be no action I take today or words of comfort I offer that will ever truly solve the pain of families who have not only lost their precious children, but have also had to then bear the burden of doubt of what happened to the ones they love. That said, I offer my heartfelt condolences as a minister, as a member of this parliament and as a father. Since this issue first came to light, I've been clear that there are two areas that must be addressed, that steps be taken to ensure that this can never be repeated, and as far as is possible, to ensure that families who seek answers in their own cases can get them. The foundation for putting those safeguards in place has been the work of the Infant Cremation Commission under the leadership of Lord Bonamy. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the members of the Commission and to those who submitted evidence to it and for their efforts. Lord Bonamy provided the final report of the Infant Cremation Commission to the Scottish Government on Thursday afternoon, and it has been published in full this morning. Through this process, Lord Bonamy visited a number of crematoria across Scotland and the rest of the UK. He spoke to professionals across the health, funeral and cremation field. And the Commission has analysed a large volume of documentation and information. The Commission makes 64 recommendations to prevent these events ever being repeated. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has accepted them in full, in full and without reservation. Lord Bonamy made certain that parents had a voice in this process. He met parents on a number of occasions, including in the last month, when he shared a draft of his report for comment. The central focus on the bereaved families is reflected in the Commission's very first recommendation, which states clearly that the interests of the child and the bereaved family should be the central focus at all times. Today, we have published a response to each and every recommendation, setting out what we will do and when we will do it. While not all of the recommendations are directly for government, our role will be to ensure progress is made. The proposals that I will outline to Parliament were agreed by the Cabinet this morning, chaired by the First Minister from Kirkwall, a commitment he had made to the parents when we met with them on Thursday. There are a number of actions we will be taking forward immediately. The need for a renewed legislative framework is highlighted by a number of recommendations not least the current definition of ashes as set out in the 1935 cremation regulations, is not fit for purpose. This was an issue Dame Elish Angelini also identified in her report on Morton Hall. It is likely that most, if not all, of the changes to law will require primary legislation. We are already committed to bringing forward a new burials and cremations bill, and we will publish a consultation on that new legislation by the end of this year. In the meantime, we will act to ensure that all crematoriums will be operating in such a way that they will already be compliant <coughs> with the new legislative provisions when they come into force. Good practice does not need to wait for legislation. The Commission recommends the establishment of a national committee chaired by the Scottish Government to have oversight in this area. We will begin work to establish the committee immediately, with the first meeting taking place over the summer, if at all possible. Affected parents will be key members of that group. Indeed, we will be involved in all of our activities to respond to these recommendations. A key first task will be to respond to Recommendation 61, which asks the National Committee to develop a code of practice for infant cremations. This will set out the minimum standards and the best practice in relation to infant 
cremations. As I have already said, good practice does not need to wait for legislation, and so the work on this code of practice will be prioritised. This code of practice will provide a robust foundation for all activities in this area. The Commission has also recommended that an inspector of crematoria be appointed with responsibility to monitor working practices at crematoria and with the authority to investigate complaints. I fully support this and will work to put this role in place as quickly as is possible. Through the proposed legislation, we will also create powers to extend that inspection function to the funeral industry, as the Commission recommends, to ensure all parts of the cremation process are subject to independent scrutiny. This work for the future is crucial, but for many parents, questions remain about what happened in the past. Just last week, we learned about further allegations emerging in relation to Hazelhead Crematorium in Aberdeen. Last year, Lord Bonamy published guidance for local authorities and private crematoria, advising how they should establish independent investigations where they were required, just as the City of Edinburgh Council established the independent investigation by Dame Eilish Angelini into the cases and practices at Morton Hall. It is very disappointing that every other affected cremation authority did not follow Lord Bonamy's guidance and launch an independent investigation in the same way that Edinburgh did. As I said earlier, the First Minister and I met some of the parents last week, and I welcome that a number of those parents are in Parliament today to hear this statement. Last week, the parents told me that many of them still do not have the answers they needed about their own case. They spoke about having nowhere to go, about not knowing where to turn. And they spoke very movingly about having to carry the burden of trying to find out what happened to their babies. Every parent who has concerns must have their case investigated and they must get the individualised response that they need. The Edinburgh investigation provided this for families affected by Morton Hall, and I believe that every family must have this same opportunity. For that reason, I am today announcing that we will launch an independent national investigation team. I'm grateful that Dame Eilish Angelini has kindly agreed to lead this work for us. Dame Eilish and her team will be able to look at every document and every record. They will interview every concerned family and will expect to speak to any officials or staff member who may hold information. They will be able to investigate cremations in local authority crematoria and in private crematoria. They will be able to look at the NHS, at funeral directors as well as crematoria. Parents can be reassured every step will be taken in order to find out what happened to their babies. In addition to investigating individual cases, following last week's announcement by Aberdeen City Council, I believe there is now particular concern about practices at Hazelhead Crematoria. Accordingly, Dame Eilish has agreed that our investigation will look more broadly at practices there. If issues emerge in the course of the investigation about other crematoria, these too will be interrogated. I should add that the remit for Dame Eilish's investigation will also include the requirement to refer to the Lord Advocate any evidence of criminality for investigation by Police Scotland. This is in keeping with the Morton Hall investigation remit. Sign officer, the national investigation team is in place now, and parents can, from today, notify us if they wish their case to be investigated. They can do this by completing a simple form which is available on the Scottish Government website or which can be sent to them by post. It is difficult to know at this point how many parents will come forward, but we will support this work however long as it takes. Sign officer, this is not the end of the road. However, the Morton Hall investigation and the Cremation Commission reports 
are significant stepping stones along the way to where we want to go. But we are not there yet. There is much still to be done. There are new laws to make. There are procedures and processes to update. And there are individual cases and crematoria which we will now investigate. Sadly, some parents will never know what happened to their children. But I hope that those parents will recognise that we will do all that we can for them to get the answers that are available. I hope all parents will recognise the important legacy of the last 18 months is that this will never be able to happen again. Thank you, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question could press the request to speak buttons now, please. Um, I call on Neil Finlay. President officer, I want to associate myself and my party with the opening words of the Minister in recognising the enormity of what has happened to these families and the pain and suffering that they have experienced in the loss of a child uh, exacerbated by the baby ashes scandal and not knowing what, happened, what has happened to their child's remains. We can sympathise, but we have not walked in their shoes, so we will never understand what they have gone through. Uh, I want to welcome the report and its 64 recommendations and the fact that the Government accepts them all and throughout the report acknowledges the need for all these actions to recognise the central role of the bereaved parents in any future changes. Scottish Labour welcomes the proposal for new legislation and we will, of course, fully support its introduction subject to the usual parliamentary scrutiny. We also share the view that good practice does not need to wait for any legislation and that this should be shared throughout Scotland, but also that any legislative and non-legislative developments be shared throughout the UK and abroad to help prevent other families, wherever they live, from having to go through what these Scottish parents have. And I'm very pleased that the parents will be part of the national committee that will be established and would ask the Minister to ensure that a broad geographical spread uh, of parents are represented on it. The report recommends a code of practice to be developed. Can the Minister advise uh, how long it might take to have that drawn up and implemented? When will the new Inspector of Crematoria be appointed and who will he or she be accountable to. We are very pleased the Independent National Investigation Team will be able to look at all cases and help, try to help find out what happened to every child. And it is right that Dame Angelini will be able to look, uh, look at these cases and uh, the, the happenings at Hazelhead in Aberdeen, a case that has caused real concern to families in that city and beyond. And finally, President Officer, while this is a good report and I commend the Government for it, I don't think we will get all the answers until we have a full public inquiry and ask the Minister will he and the Scottish Government reconsider their position in relation to such an inquiry. Minister. Uh, can I thank the Member for his support for the uh, report from Lord Boramy, which I uh, think we should all be very grateful for and the work that the Commission have undertaken and the way in which they have also conducted that process and engaging uh, with families. Uh, uh, throughout the uh, work that they have undertaken. The member uh, uh, made the specific point about sharing uh, good practice across the UK. As the member will be aware, uh, Lord Bonamy has highlighted the issue about looking at uh, whether we should uh, share that advice and information with our counterparts in the rest of the UK, uh, which we are more than willing to do, and will do so in a proactive way. Uh, to ensure that they consider our findings and also the course of work that we are taking, see if there's any lessons that they can learn um, as uh, well, because we certainly don't want to see what happened in uh, some of our crematoriums in Scotland repeated anywhere else uh, for that matter. In relation to the National uh, Committee, which is the uh, key recommendation that has been made by Lord Bonamy in Recommendation 57, it's important that we move that forward as quickly as possible because of the role it will have in developing its action plan for implementing all of the recommendations. Uh, we want that to be a committee which is made up of all of the different stakeholders, including parents, uh, who can be involved in it. And I'm more than happy to look at the geographical spread of those parents who can be a member of that committee, but also to have the representative organisations from health, the funeral industry, local authorities, all of whom have a part to play in taking this uh, agenda forward. 
and an important part of their early work will be the code of practice, because if we establish that code of practice early, it means that the areas that we will implement through legislation will already be in place. What it will effectively do is underpin that code of practice and legislation and good practice. The time frame is something which the committee will have to advise us of, uh, but we are keen for that to happen as quickly as it can uh, and within a reasonable time frame that allows them to carry out what will be a complex piece of work, uh, but to undertake it as quickly as, ca as it can be. In relation to the inspector, uh, the accountability of the inspector will be to the Scottish Government. Uh, it will be independent uh, in the role that it will undertake. I am also keen to accept uh, the recommendation from Lord Bonamy in looking at how we can extend that, ex that inspection role to the funeral industry more generally, uh, but we will require primary legislation for that purpose, and that is an area which we will take forward in the, uh, the burials and the cremations uh, uh, bill when it comes before Parliament. And in the member's final point about the public inquiry, you know, one of the things that is extremely important here is that families are able to get a full and thorough and rigorous investigation into their own individual circumstances. And as I said in the previous statement about Morton Hall, uh, a public inquiry will not deliver that for individual families. Uh, but the National Investigations Unit will be able to do exactly that to make sure that there is a detailed forensic examination of each individual case. Now, of course, if there is something that comes to light in the course of Ailey Shangelini's work, that should lead us to think that there is something more that has to be done, we will consider that. But given the very detailed work that has been undertaken by Lord Bonamy and the investigation work that Dame Ailish will now undertake, I believe that will provide us with a comprehensive picture of what has happened and what has not happened effectively within our crematorium system in Scotland. Thank you, Minister. Jackson Carlo. Uh, can I thank the Minister for advance sight of the statement? This has been one of the most distressing, depressing and gruesome episodes of this Parliament. Distressing because for those very many parents involved, events unravelled like a bolt out of the blue, plunging them back into a grief many of them had fought hard to come to terms with. Depressing because of the scale of indifference of a different era, however much we might wish it otherwise, in their approach to these matters, and that that practice was allowed to rumble on into what I think is an entirely different era and different view of how these things should be dealt with. And gruesome because of the nature of all about which we speak is intensely personal and intensely difficult. Um, can I welcome the report from uh, Lord Bonamy? Can I welcome the government response and acceptance of all the provisions and recommendations within it? And can the minister be assured of our support in giving the earliest possible uh, progress to all of those recommendations as he brings them to Parliament? Scottish Conservatives have previously called for a public inquiry, but can I say to the minister that in the light of the reports from Dame Ailish and Lord Bonamy, we are now persuaded that whilst a public inquiry should never be ruled out, the best possible hope for parents looking for a resolution of their personal circumstances does lie with the independent national investigation team and he has our support for the establishment of that body. And all these matters will he undertake to work with all sides to ensure the widest possible parliamentary support achieved with a sense of purpose and without further delay. Thank you. Minister. Uh, can I welcome the member's comments? And I do, uh, like him, recognise the real difficulty this has caused for so many families for something which they thought they had dealt with many decades ago for them to then find themselves revisited with it. And I uh, particularly welcome his recognition of the value of the National Investigation Team and someone of Dame Elish Angelini's standing and knowledge in this field been able to undertake that type of investigation for each and every individual uh, family. What I can give him an assurance of, and all members an assurance of, is that we will work on a cross-party basis uh, in taking this uh, agenda forward, in making sure that we get the right policies and practice in place and it with the right system of accountability in place in making sure that we can have faith and confidence in how the process works into uh, the future. Because I'm sure that all of us are united in our determination to make sure that this can never happen again. And that if there is a legacy that comes from this deeply depressing episode is that we have a system in place that has the right safeguards to ensure that that cannot happen. And I've got no doubt that all parties have a part to play in assisting us in achieving that. Thank you, Minister. Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, in implementing Lord Bonamy's recommendation to appoint an independent inspector who will monitor the working practices and standards at crematoria, 
Can the Minister provide further detail on how it is envisaged the Inspector will take forward the investigation of complaints from the public, when that complaints process will be up and running, and what steps the Inspector will take to provide feedback to crematoria authorities, sorry, to cremation authorities on their performance, as it strikes me that these are all vital measures which can hopefully go some way to restoring public confidence. Thank you, Minister. Well, we'll move forward with the uh, uh, inspector as quickly as we can within the existing powers which we have uh, for the purposes around uh, crematoria and cremation authorities. Uh, in terms of extending it into the uh, uh, wider uh, uh, funeral industry, we will require primary legislation in order to make it much more comprehensive. But what I can say to the member is that our intention is to have an inspection regime that allows the inspector to be able to undertake detailed inspections of the conduct of policy and practice within any crematoria in Scotland and to do so uh, without fear or favour and being able to go in and investigate the, uh, any issues. But equally, where a family uh, or relative have a point of complaint, to be able to refer that directly to the inspector and for that inspector to have the responsibility to investigate that as well. What the inspector's role will be is that not so much to look at historical matters, which will be the responsibility of Dame Eilish, Angelina and the National Inspection Unit, but to make sure that any complaints uh, thereafter are investigated thoroughly and independently and that they will report to us on a regular basis the findings of uh, their inspections of both crem uh, crem uh, crem uh, crem uh, cremation authorities, but also any uh, complaints that they inspect as well. Thank you. Sarah Boyack. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Can the minister say what timescale he has set out for putting in place the review of training for health professionals and for updating publications to ensure that bereaved parents and families get the right support and guidance referred to at Paris 2.1 and 2.54 in Lord Bornemy's report? And what support will there be for groups such as SANS and the Miscarriage Association to contribute to that work? Thank you, Minister. Uh, one of the things that I've, uh, I'll be doing this afternoon is writing to all of the agencies who have a role to play in implementing the recommendations set out by Lord Bonamy, including our NHS chief executives uh, and all of those who are involved in support organisations working with them, including those within the third sector, and for them to be feeding into the national committee uh, on the progress that they're making in implementing these recommendations. Uh, there are many of the recommendations, just in the way that, just like the ones that Sarah Boyack has mentioned, that do not require any form of legislation, and we want to see those changes implemented immediately. Uh, in relation to the organisations such as uh, uh, SANS and others who can assist them in doing so, I would expect that to be part of the process in shaping any type of information that's been delivered to parents um, who have been affected by a bereavement in using their expert, uh, expertise and their advice and how they should shape that documentation and that advice information. So all organisations uh, who have a part to play in this will be written to today by me, setting out the key recommendations that I'm asking them to implement immediately and to then feed the response into the National Committee who will be responsible for monitoring and driving forward any further work that's required in this area. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thank you, President Officer. Um, the, the Minister mentioned the, the establishment of the Inspector of Crematoria. Could you clarify, please, that it would be your intention to, to establish and extend the legislative requirements so that you would give effect legal basis to the powers that you might confer on the, the Inspector? Minister. Uh, there are a range of powers which we have under the existing uh, cremation regulations from 1935 for the purposes of uh, being able to uh, uh, regulate and investigate uh, crematoria as they stand. But in order to do it in a comprehensive way and to extend it into the whole pathway, uh, we need to make sure that that's also uh, cut the inspection purpose is also covering uh, the, uh, uh, the funeral director's aspects of it as well within the funeral industry. And in order to achieve that, we will require primary legislation, which will be a key part of the uh, new legislation that we will intend to bring before uh, the Parliament. There are obviously wider issues around regulation within the uh, funeral industry itself, and the consultation will be drafted in such a way which will allow individuals and groups to express their view around uh, what further regulation may be required within the funeral industry in Scotland. And we will consider that, and we will consider whether that should be included within any future legislation in order to ensure that the public can have confidence 
in the funeral industry in Scotland in a comprehensive way by having an investigation process to inspection, but also an appropriate regulatory process established around the system as well. Thank you. Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. I thank the Minister for advance sight of the statement. I also welcome the report and the recommendations, and I am glad that the Government are going to follow them and, of course, offer the support of the Liberal Democrats in this Parliament uh, to progress that legislation. The Minister has said that every family must have their case investigate, investigated, and I agree entirely. However, relying on the goodwill of those to provide evidence and potentially incriminate themselves seems an, an, an unlikely course of action. Can the Minister therefore explain what powers the National Investigation Team will possess to ensure it has the required teeth to compel people to provide evidence and so ensure that the investigations are robust and forensic to obtain the answers that, that the families affected deserve? Minister. Uh, there are powers within the uh, 1935 Commission regulations uh, for Scottish Ministers and being able to uh, compel documentation and uh, 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 documents relating to the cremation process. Um, uh, those powers uh, will be conferred in the National Investigation Unit. So they will have the power to be able to compel information and uh, documentation from any cremation authority for any case that they happen to be investigating. I think members should also take a level of reassurance from the fact that in the course of the investigation conducted by Dame Elish Angelini into Morton Hall and also by the investigation that has also been undertaken by Lord Bonamy and the Infant Cremations Commission, that at no point have they made any level of resistance from any party in providing them with information or in responding to their investigation uh, into these uh, matters. And I've got no reason to believe that anyone uh, would wish to do the same, uh, would wish to do so uh, with the uh, further independent investigations uh, unit. So I'm uh, assured uh, that everyone will wish to comply with it and the powers which ministers have to compel these documents and this information will be conferred on the National Investigation Unit in order to compel the necessary information as required. Thank you. Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My constituent, Nicola Merchant, is in the gallery today. Uh, Nicola lost her little boy, Liam, in 2002. He was born 16 weeks early and survived for just six hours. The Minister referred to the fresh allegations regarding the reported practice at Hazelhead Crematorium, where babies were allegedly cremated alongside adults. Uh, this has caused Nicola and many other parents enormous concern and has led to serious questions about what happened to their babies. Uh, given the recent Council audit failed to identify these practices, uh, I welcome news that the National Investigation Team will now investigate the broad practices in operation at Hazelhead Crematorium. Can the Minister provide reassurances that this will not prevent individual cases relating to the facility being investigated at the same time? And can he advise whether the contact details for the National Investigation Team will also be distributed to MSPs so we can assist in putting these out to our constituents who we are in contact with? Thank you, Minister. Uh, what I can say to the member is that uh, since the announcement was made by uh, uh, Aberdeen City Council last week about the allegations relating to uh, uh, the crematorium at Hazelhead, we have been in touch with them uh, to get clarification that the practice that uh, uh, these allegations uh, referred to uh, is no longer continuing, which they have confirmed is the case. Uh, we have also been in touch with them today to advise them of uh, establishment of the National Investigations Unit and the Acting Chief Executive has welcomed this and has accepted that it would be an appropriate way for the activities at uh, Hazelhead to be properly and thoroughly investigated. Uh, can I also say to him uh, that uh, what the National Investigations Unit will do is it will investigate individual cases and where in those individual cases it becomes apparent that there are activities or practices or policies operating within an individual crematoria that require further investigation, they will take that further investigation into that individual crematoria itself and they will look at that in great detail. And with regards to the situation in Aberdeen, uh, Dame Eilish has recognised, given the concerns that have already been highlighted, that there is a recognition of a need for further investigation into uh, activities there and will make that a part of the early inquiry which she undertakes. So it will consider both the individual and the detailed policy and practice uh, which sits around any individual cases as well. And very often it will be the individual case that will give rise to any concerns about the policy and practices which are undertaken within an individual crematorium and which will lead, then lead to even further detailed investigation into their practices and their policies. Siobhan McMahon. 
Thank you. I understand that there was in place a one-year time limit in order for brief parents to make representation under the Human Rights Act, which began when parents became aware of their own within. I was surprised to learn that one local authority has chosen not to waive that one-year time limit, which is now affecting my constituents' cases. Does the Minister share the frustration of parents in Falkirk who have lost a child and have every right to know what happened to their baby's ashes, regardless of how long it takes? And will the Scottish Government make representation to all local authorities, urging them to waive any time limits that may be in existence? Minister. Well, can I say I'm already dealing with some constituency cases uh, because Falkirk Crematorium is based in my uh, own constituency. Uh, what I can give the member an assurance of is that the investigation which will be undertaken by the National Investigations Unit uh, will look at cases uh, that could go back several decades. As and whenever that particular uh, case uh, occurred, uh, they will investigate that just exactly in the same way uh, that the Dame Elish's investigation into Morton Hall uh, was undertaken. Uh, what will then happen is that uh, uh, once that investigation has been conducted, if there are any concerns about uh, what could be interpreted as being criminal activity, uh, that that matter will then be referred to the Lord Advocate to consider whether Police Scotland then have to investigate the matter uh, further. So uh, when it comes to uh, cases that the National Investigation Unit uh, will consider, uh, they could go back uh, many decades if necessary. Uh, and if parents who have experienced issues from several decades ago, then they will investigate them in great detail. Thank you. Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Like Mr Macdonald, I'm extremely concerned about the new allegations that are emerging uh, in Aberdeen, and this is extremely worrying for families uh, in the north-east of Scotland. Can I ask the Minister if uh, Dame Ailish's independent national investigation team uh, inquiry into Hazelhead is going to run parallel to the current council inquiry, or will it take over the inquiry completely? And can I also ask if a whistleblowing policy uh, will be put in place so that uh, staff members, former and current staff members uh, and officials, uh, can contact that team directly or the new inspector when he or she is in post? Thank you, Minister. Um, my understanding, although uh, Aberdeen City Council had indicated that they intended to undertake an investigation following the allegations which they uh, 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 received last week, uh, that they uh, have as yet not put anyone in place. And following a discussion which my officials had with the acting chief executive of uh, Aberdeen City Council uh, today, uh, they've accepted that the most appropriate way for uh, the allegations at Hazel, uh, Hazelhead Crematorium to be investigated is through the National Investigations Unit, uh, uh, which will be led by Dame Eilish Angelini. So we are not anticipating a second investigation uh, to be undertaken in Aberdeen now that the National Investigations Unit has been established. In relation to the second point uh, around uh, whistleblowing, which I think is a very valid uh, uh, issue to highlight, uh, once the uh, National Inspector has been put in place, uh, what will be an important part of uh, the Inspector's role will be to ensure uh, that there is an opportunity for anyone who has concerns or issues that they wish to raise to be able to contact them in order to flag up uh, those concerns or those issues uh, in the form of a, a whistleblowing policy or whatever. But I've got no doubt that once the inspector is in place, they will wish to make sure that they have a, an opportunity for anyone uh, who may wish to raise concerns with them, whether it be families or staff, to be able to do so in a way which is also confidential so that they can then consider whether further investigations are required. Thank you. Drew Smith. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I think the, the Minister has served Parliament well with the, the sentiments that he's expressed um, today and indeed the response that he's outlined on behalf of the Scottish Government. I think he'll appreciate that those of us who have supported a, a public inquiry um, have done so because it was the, the call of the um, affected uh, the affected parent. So I um, could ask him whether he envisages that the work of the investigations team um, would lead to a full public report um, with the same care for privacy that was uh, displayed in relation to uh, Morton Hall, because I think um, the, the, that would help us all to understand the, the scale of this scandal and this tragedy and give the recognition um, that he spoke about to, to those parents who have, who have suffered uh, 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 you know, have, who have borne the, the, the suffering of, of, of what is a, a scandal and a tragedy. Thank you. Minister? Um, uh, the way in which we uh, would expect the National Investigations uh, Unit to operate is obviously is to provide the appropriate information and documentation to the affected family uh, themselves to consider 
uh, and obviously to then engage in any dialogue with the National Investigations Unit about any further information that can be uh, provided. Uh, we would also expect at the end of that process for that information to be drawn together into a comprehensive fashion, uh, which would then be submitted to Scottish ministers. And I uh, would expect that report to cover many of the issues that have already been highlighted in the Morton Hall report and also uh, in the report just uh, completed by uh, Lord uh, Bonamy. But I think in terms of drawing all of that information together, it would be a useful way um, of, uh, uh, of highlighting any further factors that need to be taken into account. And if there are any issues uh, that remain outstanding that the National Investigations Unit believe that the Scottish Government require to address, then we will act quickly in responding to those issues as and when they arise. Thank you, Minister. And finally, Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. My apologies for missing the start of uh, this afternoon's statement. Can I can I welcome the National Investigation Team and in working with the Glasgow Answers for Asses patient uh, parents? I know that um, uh, that is that will be very important to them. But so is ensuring this doesn't happen again to another uh, generation of parents that suffer similar tragedies. Concerns been raised uh, that the Dowie Crematorium in Glasgow may have difficulties, as indeed others might, in meeting a number of the recommendations contained within Lord Bonamy's report, and that uh, the current practices may still indeed have to improve. Can I ask, therefore, what support the Scottish Government can provide local authorities and crematoria with it in a constructive fashion, working in partnership with them, without, of course, diminishing the primary responsibility of local authorities to, to get this right? Thank you. Minister? Uh, officer, uh, today I will be writing to every cremation authority, including those uh, which are held by local authorities, setting out the key recommendations which we are asking them to implement immediately uh, and to take forward. That will include uh, uh, Glasgow City Council uh, and any other uh, cremation authority in Scotland um, that is responsible for the running of a, 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 crem a, a crematorium. It is important that we do not wait until legislation is in place. And as I have uh, said to members, our intention is to get the National Committee up and running, to get the uh, Code of Practice in place and to implement these changes as quickly as we can. Uh, in order to make sure there is a consistency of approach right across the country uh, in practice and in policy uh, in this whole area. And the National Committee will be key to supporting us in achieving that, so that by the time we get to the point of legislation, uh, we will be in a position where the policy and practices will have already uh, changed. So in relation to Daldawi, uh, the recommendations that have been set out by Lord Bonamy uh, will be intimated to uh, the Commission Authority responsible for Daldawi um, uh, today, and we will be asking them to implement them uh, forthwith uh, to ensure there are any changes that are required to their policy and practices. Many thanks. That concludes the ministerial statement. I okay. will give a few seconds for members to change places if they so wish. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 10268 in the name of Kenneth Gibson on a written agreement on the budget process. I would invite those members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Kenneth Gibson to speak to and move the motion. On behalf of the Finance Committee, Mr Gibson, five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to speak on behalf of the Finance Committee in inviting the Parliament to note the revised written agreement between the Committee and the Scottish Government on the budget process. The revisions made relate to the introduction of the financial powers contained in the Scotland Act 2012. For the purposes of the draft budget to be introduced in autumn this year, the taxes that will be included are the two devolved taxes, the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax and the Scottish Landfill Tax. Members may also note that it is intended to revisit the written agreement in due course to recognise the introduction of the Scottish Rate of Income Tax, and the Committee will, of course, invite the Parliament to acknowledge any changes in that regard. The written agreement is an important document that sets out the expectations we and the Government should have of each other in scrutinising financial matters. Please note that this debate should be viewed in conjunction with the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee debate that will immediately follow. Without trailing it too heavily, the small but perfectly formed changes to standing orders which will be invited to agree 
for the first time make scrutiny of government proposals for revenue raising an explicit responsibility of the Finance Committee and the Parliament. Turning to the written agreement itself, I will first set out what the changes mean for parliamentary scrutiny. Following this, I will say a few words about the information the Government will provide Parliament to inform that scrutiny. The main changes to Parliament's role in scrutinising the draft budget are set out in paragraphs 14 to 16 of the revised written agreement. Until now, it has been the case that it was within the Finance Committee's power to bring forward in its draft budget report a set of alternative spending proposals. Under the revised written agreement, this has now been expanded to include alternative proposals for spending and taxation. Without alternative proposals, the Committee will also be able to make recommendations on the Government's tax proposals. It will also be the case that subject committees are able to recommend alternative budget proposals for both tax and spending in their reports to the Finance Committee. The extension of this power to both spending and revenue is a significant and welcome development for the Committee and is designed to ensure we are in a position to make effective use of it, if and when we choose to do so. Recognising this, from this year on, a significant focus of the Finance Committee's scrutiny will be on the revenue-raising proposals of the Scottish Government. As has been true of spending powers, in suggesting changes to the draft budget, budget proposal set out by the Scottish Government, the Finance Committee must consider the overall shape of the budget. Any increase in overall spending must, therefore, be connected with a commensurate increase in tax levels. The written agreement also makes clear that any recommendation to increase tax levels should identify how the additional funding should be allocated. The obvious is also true in that any recommendation to decrease tax levels should also identify where spending should be reduced. Any other committees or individual members who wish to make alternative proposals will be able to do so by tabling amendments to the Finance Committee motion on the draft budget. Any tabled amendments to the motion must follow the same balancing requirements in terms of the overall budget as applied to the Finance Committee, with increases or decreases in spending being matched in revenue terms and identifying where any changes would be reflected in the budget. While this is a welcome position for Parliament, it would be remiss of me not to point out that such amendments do not automatically guarantee amendment of the Budget Bill itself. Paragraphs 19 to 23 of the revised agreement set out what information will be provided by the Scottish Government to enable Parliament to carry out its scrutiny. This includes a commentary on the expected income, including tax receipt forecasts and the assumptions, rates and thresholds on which they are based. In future years, when information on actual receipts is available, the draft budget commentary will also include outturn figures for the devolved taxes, including any variance between outturn and forecasts. The estimates are intended to provide context to the draft budget and inform Parliament's scrutiny of it, but they are not intended to constrain the Government from making any adjustment to the indicative tax rates and thresholds prior to the Parliament's scrutiny of the relevant subordinate legislation. Presiding Officer, I move motion S4M10268 in my name. Thank you. <coughs> Many thanks. And I now call on John Swinney. Cabinet Secretary, you have six minutes. Uh, President Officer, I welcome this debate and the remarks that have been made by the convener and I endorse the proposed changes to the written agreement. These reflect careful consideration by the Government and the Committee and a consensus view on how we should reflect the impact of the Scotland Act 2012 in our budget process. The decisions we take collectively about public expenditure are amongst the most important for which we are responsible. The impact on our economy, on our public services, on the environment and on our citizens. The procedures we follow when taking such decisions have served us well since devolution, but we must ensure that they, re that they remain robust as the surrounding financial and constitutional context changes. I have experienced firsthand both in opposition and in my time as the Finance Secretary the strength of our budgeting arrangements. They support a transparent, consultative approach to decisions about public spending and compare well with practice in other legislatures. The budget process, as detailed in the written agreement, strikes an effective balance between the respective roles of government and of parliament. It reflects the importance of our committee structure and provides scope for detailed scrutiny and debate with stakeholders. Over time, the Scottish Government and the Finance Committee have worked together to refine the written agreement, to reflect changing circumstances and to support effective parliamentary process. We have worked to pursue shared interests in the effective presentation of the budget document, uh, changing the emphasis of that document to inc include an increasing focus on the achievement of better outcomes for our citizens, um, along with the need for strategic consideration 
of the content and development of the public finances. The implementation of the Scotland Act 2012 now requires us to make further changes to the written agreement. The Scotland Act devolves, with effect from 2015-16, responsibility for landfill tax and stamp duty land tax, as well as the power to borrow to support capital investment. We welcome these developments while noting that together, devolved taxes and capital borrowing would represent a relatively modest 2.5 to 3% of devolved expenditure. As the updated written agreement makes clear, the Government will set out its proposals for the bans and the rates of the two taxes in the draft budget 2015-16, which is due to be published in October. We will also provide a commentary on the expected income to be generated by the taxes and the forecasts that underpin the Government's plans. To support, wider, to support parliamentary and wider scrutiny of the draft budget, we are establishing the Scottish Fiscal Commission, which will provide an independent commentary on the Government's tax receipt forecasts. The written agreement also makes clear that committees and individual members have the scope to advance their own tax proposals, provided they form part of a balanced budget proposition, while reserving legislative responsibility for setting tax rates and thresholds to the Government. Through this approach, we can support effective public scrutiny and debate while delivering reasonable certainty in the budget process, which is necessary for effective planning of public expenditure and which also helps taxpayers' preparations. We will also set out in the draft budget further information about capital borrowing, building on the material presented in last year's document, which will all form part of the Government's integrated capital plan to stimulate and to improve the performance of the Scottish economy. Looking further ahead, the agreement notes, the additional changes that, uh, that the agreement notes that additional changes would be needed in due course to reflect the introduction from 2016-17 of the Scottish rate of income tax. And of course, uh, the government will engage uh, closely with the committee in the formulation of um, all uh, amendments and revisions to the agreement which are required to facilitate the implementation of the proper scrutiny of arrangements surrounding the Scottish rate of income tax. And of course, I stand ready to work with Parliament to consider the implications for our processes of a positive vote for change in the referendum later this year. Presiding officer, I look forward to working with the Finance Committee and colleagues across the Chamber through this year's budget process, and I commend to Parliament the proposed updates to the written agreement. Many thanks. I now call on Ian Gray, four minutes or so. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and uh, uh, we also would like to endorse the, uh, the written agreement between the, the Committee and uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, and uh, place on record our thanks to the Finance Committee for the work they've done in achieving uh, this uh, agreed and consensual document. Mr. Gray, Mr Gray, could you lift your microphone up, please? Oops. Many thanks. It does, as the convener made clear, um, clarify, improve and expand some elements of the, the budget scrutiny process. It uh, clarifies the budget strategy phase, which of course takes place in spending review uh, years. It includes what I guess is a, a recommitment to the provision of level four uh, detail figures for scrutiny. And that, that's been a, a, an on, ongoing problem, I think, in terms of the amount of information which committees feel they've been provided with, but there is a clear commitment here to provide uh, greater detail than level three, and that's good. And it does, of course, as both the convener and the cabinet secretary described, uh, uh, outline how the scrutiny process will deal with the new powers uh, which uh, the Scottish Government and this Parliament uh, are uh, undertaking, uh, mostly in terms of how we can raise finance, particularly through uh, the land transaction tax and the landfill tax, but also through the capacity uh, to borrow. All of that, I think, is very welcome, uh, as is the broadening of the opportunities committees have uh, to influence uh, budget decisions and to propose uh, their own alternative amendments. That seems to us to improve as well the scrutiny process. So all of that is to be uh, welcomed. Um, I, I, I'm afraid though, presiding officer, I can't really let this uh, pass without uh, noting the irony that having reached this consensual agreement, we do it uh, and the Scottish Government immediately invoke paragraph 12 uh, where the Scottish Government believes it may not be able to meet the 20th September deadline, that is the deadline for publication of the draft budget, 
Scottish ministers will consult the Finance Committee on a revised timescale. And of course, that has been necessary this year, and the committee uh, have indeed uh, dealt with this with the Cabinet Secretary uh, as a result of the change to a recess uh, and the, uh, the referendum on September the 18th. We've uh, <coughs> often argued uh, that the referendum process has stopped important decisions being taken and delayed scrutiny of uh, normal governance of this country. This is a, a classic example of it, I think, uh, because uh, potentially, of course, it squeezes the amount of time the Parliament and committees have for scrutin scrutiny because of the late publication of the draft budget. Now, it is clear, of course, that the draft budget could not have been uh, published at the usual time because that would have fallen in recess and that would not, of course, have been appropriate. The question simply is, why not publish it early rather than late? The Cabinet Secretary must surely be already working on uh, next year's budget. He already has on past occasion published indicative figures, so as some idea of the basis on which he is uh, calculating next year's budget. And it does rather beg the question uh, what perhaps the Scottish Government is hiding, what difficult spending decisions have been pushed beyond the referendum. No doubt the Cabinet Secretary will feel that's an unjust accusation. If he does so, the simple solution would have been for him to have published early uh, rather than late. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this side of the, part, uh, of the chamber certainly welcomes the new framework uh, and once again puts on record our thanks to the committee uh, and indeed the Cabinet Secretary for reaching agreement on it. Many thanks. And I now call on Gavin Brown. Again, four minutes or so. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The uh, motion before us asks us to note the revised written agreement on the budget process between the Scottish Parliament and the Finance Committee, which, of course, uh, at this side of the chamber will certainly do now and, of course, at decision time. Mr Brown, the, sorry, could you direct your microphone slightly round? Many thanks. The Scotland Act 2012, I think, brings some significant changes to the Scottish Parliament, uh, to the Scottish Government and, most importantly, to the budget process that we are discussing just now. We will have to look at the Scottish Government's forecasts, their specific forecasts for the land and buildings transaction tax, a new tax, and for the landfill tax, which is more of a replacement tax. We will have to look specifically for the first time at the rates and the bans for both of these taxes, which will have an impact on a number of companies, businesses and voters across Scotland. We will have to consider carefully the Scottish Fiscal Commission report. They, of course, will report on the two devolved taxes that we talked about, but also, I think for the first time, on business rates. And it will give the opportunity to examine carefully the government's forecast for business rates. We will have to consider carefully the borrowing plans laid out by the Scottish Government and, of course, extremely importantly, the block grant adjustment mechanism and the actual effect of that mechanism of the budget for that financial year coming up. So there is a huge amount for this Parliament to do, and in particular for the Finance Committee to do when looking at next year's budget and indeed every budget after that. It is worth dwelling, though, on how we got here for the 2015-16 budget. And I think it is a good example of a committee doing its job, challenging assertions by government so that we end up in a better place for this Parliament. Because the government initially when they wrote to the Finance Committee in November, suggested that the budget should be published by mid-November of this year. Now, that would have given the Finance Committee about six weeks in which to scrutinise the Scottish budget, which would be a tough ask in any year. But when you add in all the elements I referred to at the beginning of my contribution, the landfill tax, LBTT, borrowing and block grant adjustment, to have expected this Parliament to scrutinise the budget in that period of time, I think, quite simply, was unachievable. So the Finance Committee, in the guise of the convener, wrote very clearly to the government saying that we didn't think mid-November was acceptable and we didn't see any reason why it couldn't be as soon as possible after Parliament recommencing after the referendum. The Scottish Government responded several months later, uh, trying to offer a compromise of the 30th of October by which to publish the budget. But again, uh, certainly my view and the view of the committee 
was that that would not give Parliament enough time to scrutinise the 15-16 budget, again particularly given all the more complex issues that we would be looking at for the very first time. The committee wrote back again uh, stressing that they didn't think the 30th of October was acceptable and that we couldn't see any reason why the Scottish Government would want to delay this any more than the first week or two after we came back uh, from the referendum and certainly before the first uh, part of the October recess. Eventually, um, in March of this year, the Scottish Government wrote back and accepted the committee's recommendation. So it was five items of correspondence over a four-month period. But ultimately, I think it is an example of the Finance Committee doing its job and therefore we get the best possible scrutiny of this budget instead of what was proposed, which would have been, I think, a small number of weeks and clearly not enough to do the job that we were being asked to do. Thank you. Many thanks. We now have a short open debate and I call Jamie Hepburn around four minutes or so. Thank you, President Officer. I cannot help but reflect where Ian Gray pontificates in hiding matter. It's his party which has established a cuts commission which won't report till after the referendum. But to the matter at hand, uh, presiding officer, uh, this agreement is uh, an important one because it allows uh, this parliament uh, the ability to scrutinise the government budget proposals in a transparent and open matter. And it's clear that from time to time uh, the, uh, we will need to update the agreement in light of new developments in the Scotland Act 2012 and the devolution of landfill tax and stamp duty uh, land tax as it was, as it will be known in future land and buildings transaction uh, uh, tax uh, as one uh, such uh, uh, instance. And we know that the, this parliament is uh, putting in uh, place the uh, measures to take forward uh, the, uh, the devolution of these powers by passing the landfill tax bill and the land and building transaction bill. We're getting on with the revenue Scotland and tax powers bill. And of course, the government is putting in place arrangements to establish an independent fiscal commission, which will uh, further enhance and aid uh, parliamentary budget scrutiny. So it's correct then to update uh, this written agreement to reflect uh, this uh, new reality. And indeed, uh, the agreement says, in respect of the two devolved taxes, the draft budget will include a commentary on the expected income, including tax receipt forecasts and the assumptions, rates and thresholds on which they are based. The commentary will also reflect the views of the Scottish Fiscal Commission on the level of receipts. So all this work that we are undertaking as a parliament will be reflected in the new agreement. I want to turn to another important uh, consequence of the Scotland Act 2012, though, which is also uh, reflected in uh, the written agreement, and it was referred to by uh, Mr Brown. That is the issue of the block grant adjustment. The agreement uh, says at paragraph 23, the Scottish Government will provide information about the calculation of adjustments to the Scottish block grant carried out by HM uh, Treasury. And uh, uh, the UK uh, Government command paper, which informed uh, this Parliament and indeed the Westminster Parliament's uh, consideration of Scotland Act 2012 said when the smaller taxes devolved, currently planned to be April 2015, there will be a one-off reduction which will then be deducted from the block grant uh, for all future years. In their most uh, recent uh, report on the implementation of the Scotland Act 2012, uh, President Officer, the UK Government uh, reported a change in that position. They now want to reduce uh, the uh, block grant baseline and adjust uh, the Barnet form. This could involve a different level of adjustment on a year-on-year -year basis, not the one-off adjustment expected by this Parliament and, indeed, the Westminster Parliament when we agreed uh, the Scotland Act uh, 2012. David Gawke, the Exchequer uh, te Secretary to the te Treasury, told the Finance Committee uh, last week that it would be a one-off adjustment because it was being agreed uh, on a one-off basis one time and the Barnet for formula was not being changed, merely updated. I would posit that these uh, words are semantics and the UK government seems to be clearly uh, shifting the goalposts away from what this parliament uh, agreed when we uh, uh, agreed the uh, Scotland Act uh, 2012 to go uh, forward. This is an important matter for the agreement we debate uh, today because the block grant adjustment will be an important uh, part of uh, parliament's budget uh, scrutiny. I do hope that uh, the Westminster government will play fairer than they seeming to, uh, seem to be at the moment in agreeing this matter with the Scottish Government. And I think it's important for this Parliament to emphasise agreeing it uh, soon, because this uh, will affect this uh, coming uh, budget process. And I think it's important that that message uh, uh, comes from uh, this debate, President Officer. Uh, in conclusion, though, can I commend uh, this agreement? Can I welcome the approach taken by uh, the Scottish Government in uh, working with the Finance Committee to put the agreement in place? Because it is very important for this uh, Parliament that we see uh, such an agreement put in place to ensure that we uh, can undertake the thorough job of scrutinising uh, the coming budget and future budgets as well. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks. 
And that concludes the open part of the debate. And I now call on John Mason to wind up the debate on behalf of the Finance Committee. Mr Mason, around four minutes or so. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And you were absolutely right when you said it was a short open uh, debate. I've never seen an open debate completely filled by Mr Hepburn before. I'm, I'm say, I have to say I'm pleased to uh, be able to close this debate on the revised written agreement between the Finance Committee and the Scottish Government on the budget process. In his opening speech, the convener set out what the revised written agreement means in terms of the expectations on the Parliament and the Government. With that having been explained, I will say a little about what that means in terms of scrutiny of the draft budget in practice and how we can move our approach to financial scrutiny forward. In our report on the draft budget for 2014-15, the Finance Committee agreed to adopt four principles of financial scrutiny, namely affordability, prioritisation, prioritisation, value for money and budget processes. These principles provide a framework for the budget process that recognises the distinct roles for the Finance Committee and the subject committees. The issues of prioritisation and value for money will be for subject committees to pursue in their scrutiny, looking at the decisions the Scottish Government makes in directing its resources and how effectively public services spend that money to achieve outcomes. Questions of affordability and budget processes will be for the Finance Committee to consider, asking whether the appropriate balance has been struck between revenue expenditure and about the integration between service planning and performance budgeting. The written agreement already recognises an element of the budget process's principle, with the draft budget including an overall assessment of the progress that is being made towards a more preventative approach to public spending. It is under the principle of affordability that will provide us with a new challenge in scrutinising the use of the financial powers in the Scotland Act 2012. This includes the government's revenue forecasts, the commentary that will be provided on these forecasts, details of any planned borrowing and information about the calculation of the adjustment to the Scottish Block grant to take account of expected revenue levels. This year, the Finance Committee intends to use its call for evidence to focus on the revenues that might be raised by the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax and will be seeking views on the impact of the rates and thresholds that the Government sets for that tax. In doing so, the Committee may have regard to the likely impact on the property market and the wider economy of the level at which taxes are set. Undertaking this scrutiny at the earliest opportunity should ensure that we start to develop the experience necessary to fully scrutinise revenue decisions in future years. In debating the Committee's report on the draft budget 2014-15, the Cabinet Secretary challenged the committees involved in the budget scrutiny to tell him how the Government could improve the linkage between expenditure and performance as measured through the National Performance Framework, a framework, it has to be said, that has been widely welcomed. I am confident that the scrutiny framework we now have in place will enable committees to respond to this challenge positively and constructively. Now, I realise this has not been the most uh, confrontational or contentious of debates, uh, but one or two interesting points have been made uh, along the way, for example, uh, by Ian Gray in relation to the timetable. Um, I think it has to be accepted that there had to be a change of timetable this year, and broadly speaking, the committee uh, was in agreement about that, and I think Gavin Brown gave a very positive report on how the Cabinet Secretary had moved on his initial proposed timetable. I think I would just say to Ian Gray, though, as well as an accountant, that we have to have some sympathy for the staff, and it's all very well saying that the Cabinet Secretary could bring forward a budget somewhat earlier, but there are practical implications to that. So, in closing, Presiding Officer, the revised written agreement makes a clear transition in the approach to financial scrutiny and the role the committees of the Parliament have in holding the Government to account for its budget decisions. I know that I and other members of the Finance Committee are very much looking forward to scrutinising the forthcoming draft budget. Thank you. Many thanks. And that concludes the Finance Committee's debate on a written agreement on the budget process, and it's now time to move on to the next item of business which is consideration of motion number 10312 in the name of Stuart Stevenson on the standing order rule changes budget process. And I call on Stuart Stevenson to move the motion on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, please. 
Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak to the small but perfectly formed changes uh, that Mr Gibson referred to. They are, in fact, the addition of 14 words to the standing orders, five of which are the word revenue. The Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee has considered what changes are required to the standing orders as a result of the revised written agreement between the Finance Committee and the Scottish Government and the financial powers introduced by the Scotland Act 2012, which came into effect in, April, come into effect in April 2015. Currently, standing orders only includes the high-level rules governing the budget process. For example, the requirement to publish a draft budget by 20th September each year. As we've heard in the previous debate, the specific details of the budget process are set out in the written agreement. We think this is the right approach and are recommending that it is continued. It is the advantage of flexibility because the budget process can be adjusted in the written agreement without the need to amend standing orders. The changes we are recommending to standing orders are therefore relatively limited as we are not proposing any significant changes to the broad structure of the budget process. The changes add references to public revenue alongside public expenditure at appropriate points in the standing orders to reflect the new requirement to consider the receipts from the devolved taxes. The Scottish rate of income tax will not come into force until 2016-17, and so we are not including references to this tax in standing orders at this time. There may be a requirement to make further amendments to standing orders in about a year's time, in preparation for the Scottish rate of income tax coming into force. The motion in my name invites Parliament to note the committee's report and to agree that the changes to standing orders are made with effect from the 27th of June 2014. I move the motion S4M 10312 in my name. Many thanks. And the question on this motion will be put at decision time. It's now time to move on to the next item of business which is a debate on motion number 10347 in the name of Hamza Youssef on asylum seekers and refugees, the need to create a more humane sy a system. Could I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please? And I call on Hamza Youssef to speak to and move the motion. Minister, you have around 10 minutes with time at this stage for interventions. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, last night, uh, I had the enormous pleasure of speaking at the launch of Refugee Week Scotland 2014 at the stunning venue, uh, the Old Fruit Market in Glasgow. Uh, Refugee Week in Scotland, which is coordinated by the Scottish Refugee Council, uh, is now 14 years old. It's bigger uh, and better uh, than ever, with over 120 cultural and community events and workshops around Scotland celebrating the diversity and the various contributions of our refugee communities. It was a great spectacle uh, to be a part of this year. Uh, this year's theme, and every year is, is themed, uh, this year's theme is welcome, uh, giving the strong message that refugees and people claiming asylum in Scotland are welcome to our country, a very appropriate theme uh, for the year of homecoming, and also very appropriate for this year, of course, when we have uh, 70 nations and territories of the Commonwealth uh, being welcomed uh, to Scotland and to Glasgow more specifically. Uh, highly appropriate also because of the various negativity we've heard uh, in some elements of the media, some elements of, of the political structure as well towards migrants, uh, but also towards refugees and asylum seekers too. Presiding officer, we live in uh, a world where people travel more and more. Uh, however, not everybody who travels has a choice in the matter. Uh, they travel because they are searching for safety, because they're searching for sanctuary. And Scotland, as we all know, across this chamber, has a long history of welcoming people from all across the world, whether they're visitors, whether they're students, whether they're migrant workers, or indeed those who are fleeing persecution and looking for asylum, as well as the dispersal of asylum seekers uh, by the Home Office uh, in Glasgow over the last 13 years, 14 years. Uh, we've also had a history of supporting refugee resettlement. But even before that, it's not something that goes on just years, but decades and even centuries. Uh, you know, the mid-19th century at the time of the great hunger in Ireland, uh, Glasgow and Scotland uh, also uh, gave sanctuary, not without its problems, of course, and difficulties, but gave sanctuaries, sanctuary to those who are suffering uh, a great persecution and, and hunger. 
Um, over the last 20 years and more recent times, we've had refugees uh, from Bosnia, from Kosovo, from DRC, uh, but of course asylum seekers uh, who have come out with the resettlement programme too, from uh, Iraq, from Afghanistan, and most recently, as many of us know, uh, from Syria. And uh, we celebrate the contribution uh, that our refugee communities have made to Scotland, uh, culturally, socially, and even uh, uh, economically as well. Uh, during my time as a minister and before that as an MSP and even in various other guises, a uh, great pleasure of meeting many asylum seekers and refugees, as probably most of this chamber uh, have done too. Uh, greatly impressed by their determination to rebuild their lives uh, in Scotland and contribute to Scottish society. They, uh, out, not out of choice, have left their home, the place that they call home, and you can see in their eyes a determination to make sure that they succeed in what is their new home. However, it's also been made abundantly clear to me that there are barriers that are built into the asylum system specifically, uh, which uh, do not make integration uh, easy. In fact, they make integration a lot more difficult, uh, but in some cases, very clearly, also exacerbate the terrible trauma uh, that people have faced and people suffer. None of us, none of us uh, can imagine what it's like to have to leave your home in the midst of persecution, in the midst of conflict, in the middle of uh, the threat of sexual violence. Uh, but then on top of that, and having to navigate your way out of a country, and then into another country when you face a number of barriers that would be there anyway, regardless of the asylum process, such as language and so on and so forth, uh, then you know, it, is, it is a difficult thing to, for any of us to, to compre comprehend. The barriers to integration cited today by refugees and asylum seekers reflect long-standing concerns about the highly negative impact of the UK asylum system over successive years. Uh, those are concerns that are not just expressed by the Scottish Government, uh, indeed by previous Scottish administrations, and I think are shared by many people uh, of many parties. I will highlight some of those uh, impacts uh, of the asylum system. Uh, people have waited uh, many, many years for the Home Office to reach their decision. Uh, all of us, again, as members of the Scottish Parliament, have always had asylum seekers come to us. Uh, and I've been aghast that some have had to wait over 10 years for a decision. I came across a young lady yesterday who was telling me that she's waited 20 years uh, and her decision has still not been complete. In fact, she went to the Home Office a couple of days ago and asked whether or not she wanted to return home. She said, well, after 20 years, you know, I am uh, home. And she was quite correct to, to say that. Um, while I recognise that uh, the time to, 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 to process asylum applications uh, has uh, slightly improved, the vast majority of people who seek asylum in Scotland still face a harrowing trip to the Home Office in Croydon for initial screening. It's not a statutory requirement to be screened in Croydon, and I believe, uh, and I think there will be widespread support for this, that those who have claimed asylum in Scotland, they should be screened here. Uh, there, is, there are trained staff in Scotland. This would result in a system that's more efficient, more effective, but I would say that is more fair uh, to those who are seeking asylum and refugee status in Scotland. I hope that's a point that the whole chamber can unite across. Uh, the ethos of the screening process should be supportive, it should be enabling, it should be help people to tell their story in a culture uh, where the default is not disbelief uh, or suspicion. Now, that is not to say that all claims for asylum should be granted. Nobody is suggesting such a thing. But everyone who seeks asylum should be treated, and I think these are the important words, with dignity and compassion as their case is considered. And that dignity and that compassion so often we're told from asylum seekers is what is missing in the system. Uh, presenting officer, in, in my own role as Minister for External Affairs, I've had the great opportunity of travelling uh, overseas and uh, many across the chamber. Again, when you travel uh, sometimes for a long time, if you're away for days or weeks, uh, the best thing uh, is that flight back home. When you arrive, wherever you are, in Glasgow and Edinburgh and other parts of the country, once you arrive, uh, you feel like you're at home. You know that there's home comforts waiting for you. You know there's a family often waiting for you. Uh, you know that there's a warm bed that is your own where there's no better sleep to be had. Home is home. Nothing is better than arriving home. Having a place to call home is a most basic need for everybody. Uh, a home that is secure, uh, that is in good repair, provides, of course, a substantial contribution to the health and well-being and the quality uh, of your own life. Uh, for refugees and asylum seekers escaping the trauma of war, of instability, um, the home contributes to the stability uh, which they so desperately need. Unfortunately, I hear too many cases of poor housing conditions where repairs are not carried out timidly, uh, overcrowding, 
uh, people facing frequent accommodation moves, preventing them from settling in uh, to communities. Uh, another area of great cons concern is the uh, support uh, that is given to asylum seekers or perhaps not given or the lack of support. Uh, those on Section 4 support don't receive cash. They're given this card, which we've talked about in the, in the Parliament before in the Members' Debate, the Azure card, uh, to enable them to buy food and other necessities only from certain shops. Uh, this is, uh, presiding officer, humiliating and dehumanising. Uh, the lack of cash makes it difficult to access basics uh, like culturally appropriate food and public transport, but it is at its essence dehumanising, uh, not to trust people with cash, but to give them a card, uh, a bit of plastic and say, well, uh, you know, you're not deserving uh, of, of, of real money. And it makes it difficult for their lives. And many asylum seekers have told me uh, that uh, with this card, their child might come to them for 50 pence for the tuck shop at the local school, but you can't cut up the card and give them 50 pence. They only have what's on that card. And although, you know, buying something from the school tuck shop is not a, a fundamental human right, uh, it is, of course, important for children to feel like uh, they, uh, they are able to participate fully uh, in their school life and in their educational life as well. A fear of destitution and actual destitution are very real for asylum seekers who cannot uh, work. Uh, as well, uh, presiding officer. Uh, we've put forward our, uh, our proposals in regards to uh, integration from day one. I'm very proud that in the Scottish Government, uh, we don't have, of course, as you know, control over uh, immigration and asylum policy fully, but where we do, we ensure that, uh, that, that integration is carried out from day one, not when somebody's status is settled or otherwise. And we've produced uh, the New Scots uh, strategy, which uh, many in the chamber will be familiar with. And, uh, uh, that, uh, as I say, that uh, is, was uh, contributed to from COSLA, uh, the Scottish Refugee Council, but importantly uh, from asylum seekers and refugees uh, themselves, as well as a clear framework for the next three years for all of those working towards refugee integration. Uh, two of the projects, for example, that uh, have been a run on, uh, two of the projects that have been supporting asylum integration uh, are, for example, the Scottish Guardianship Service, uh, which is a unique service working with unaccompanied asylum seeking children who are separated from families. Uh, another project uh, which uh, takes into the ethos this, this, this integration from day one idea is the Family Key Worker Pilot uh, for newly arrived asylum seekers, which provides support from the day of arrival to ensure that um, asylum seekers get the help that they need throughout the process from day one. Uh, we are, of course, uh, 92 days away from uh, the referendum on Scottish uh, independence. There is a, a uh, debate where people are talking about the values of what's important to us as a country and as a nation. And I think this debate on asylum and how we treat those who are seeking asylum, who are fleeing persecution and prosecution, uh, are indeed uh, is, a, is an important part uh, of that debate. In our propositions in Scotland's future, the White Paper, uh, we're very clear, presiding officer, that asylum uh, too often gets politicised. So we, uh, we propose to separate immigration uh, from asylum for that purpose. We also build a system that is built entirely on compassion. We say that uh, from the very beginning, we will close the Dungable Detention Centre. So we believe that that is absolutely incorrect and inhumane uh, way to treat uh, those who have failed asylum. We will give asylum seekers the right and the dignity of work. Uh, we will end the practice of dawn raids as well. Uh, so, presiding officer, uh, in conclusion, I'd like to pay tribute to all the organisations and individuals who have worked hard to support refugees uh, and asylum seekers, uh, help them to rebuild their lives and integrate uh, in Scotland over the many, many years. Our desire to create a more humane system uh, reflects our vision of the society and the country that we very much aspire to be, uh, one that is open, one that is welcoming, one that is tolerant, a country that protects people fleeing persecution and violence, one that treats them with the sensitivity and compassion they deserve, that does not add to their trauma and that helps them to rebuild their lives in our vibrant, diverse and inclusive country. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Jamie McGregor to speak to and move Amendment 10347.1. Mr McGregor, you have up to eight minutes, if you wish. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm pleased to take part in today's debate. And let me say at the outset that I'm proud of the fact that the UK has a long and distinguished record of offering asylum and providing a place of safety to those genuinely fleeing persecution across the globe. We recognise that many of those who come to Britain seeking asylum have, suffer have suffered terrifying experiences and made a huge effort to reach our borders. 
It's important we treat these people with compassion, dignity and respect, as indeed the Minister has said. Um, and I don't think there's any argument over that. Um, and as all modern liberal democracies should treat them, I think in most people believe um, in individual and collective freedom within the rule of law is the basis of our democracy. In terms of how we deal with asylum seekers who arrive in this country, the key is having a system of assessment that is efficient, robust, transparent, and it processes the cases as quickly as possible. And above all, it must be fair. This is fundamental so that we can then offer the appropriate support to genuine asylum seekers and refugees. We need to recognize that some of the people coming to the country seeking as asylum may not be genuine, but want to come here for other reasons, including economic ones. In the interests of the genuine asylum seekers, therefore, these people must be removed from the country as smoothly as possible, and we support the UK government in taking all the necessary steps to remove those who have no valid grounds to stay here. The UK coalition government inherited an asylum system that many described as chaotic and dysfunctional with a massive backload of cases, and it is making steady pro progress at the moment in putting this right. Now, the UK takes a positive role in working with fellow EU member states to ensure that asylum flows are properly managed and those in genuine need of protection are given it without undue delay, while those who do not need protection are swiftly refused asylum and returned to their own countries. The detention of children of asylum seekers has been debated in this parliament before. Indeed, I spoke in a debate on the subject in 2009. I'm delighted that the UK coalition has made real progress in this area as it has sought to ensure that the welfare of children is promoted. It ended the detention of children at Dungaval as soon as it was elected in 2010. And Home Office policy is very clear that family detention is used only as a last resort in the removal of failed asylum seekers from the UK. After all, voluntary returns, after all, voluntary returns options have failed and an independent family returns panel is consulted prior to every enforced return. What was the Minister? Who was you, sir? Gregor for giving way. He mentioned that he's pleased that the coalition government uh, made that step of not detaining children in Dungavel. Then what is his reaction to when Scottish children or children from Scotland are taken for detention down, to, down in Yarlswood? Why does it make any difference just because it's in Yarlswood? Yeah, yeah. Jim McGregor? Well, I'll have to, uh, uh, Minister, if that's really the case, um, then, then I'll have to come back to it another time with an answer to that. But I, I, all I know is what I said to, is, is true. Um, dawn raids on, on failed asylum seekers has also been a real issue of concern that has been voiced in this Parliament in previous years. Indeed, I voiced these concerns myself. Again, we would want to see such raids used only as a last resort. But where a family has chosen to break the law and defy the decisions of UK courts, we have to allow the agencies time and place to carry out operations to rectify that situation and ensure compliance with our laws. The timing of such operations will depend on a number of factors, including the safety of the family and others, and any concerns raised by the police and others around public order. In terms of the issue of allowing asylum seekers to work, the UK government is clear that the purpose of the current policy is to deter economic migration through the asylum route. It should come through, economic migration comes through other routes. In relation to the level of financial benefits provided to asylum seekers in the UK, in addition to the free accommodation and utilities provided by the government, I'm aware of the recent court ruling on this subject and the Home Office is considering a range of options and wants, and once again to avoid doing anything that might encourage economic migration through asylum. Those granted refugee status can of course access welfare benefits and tax credits just as UK nationals can, as well as entering the labour market. Now, and I want to conclude by paying tribute to those charities in Scotland working with genuine asylum seekers and refugees. We should all command, commend the good work they undertake. We're supportive of moves to encourage refugees to integrate with our communities in this respect. And we agree, in this respect, we do agree with the new Scots document. 
and recognise the positive part they can play in society. Um, I, I hope we will work with other EU countries as they are doing in order to do something about the disasters at sea which have, in which so many people, unfortunate people have been drowned. Um, I move my amendment which emphasises the need to ensure our asylum system is efficient and fair, one that deals with cases in the shortest possible time so that some of the problems about which we will hear about today are not suffered by asylum seekers waiting months and months for a decision to be made. Thank you. Thank you so much. I now call on Alison McInnes uh, to speak to and move Amendment 10347.2. Um, a generous six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I too welcome this debate, which is fitting um, in this Refugee Week. I'm in no doubt that across the Chamber, we want to see the asylum system constantly improving and evolving. And we should therefore welcome the ambition in the New Scots report to better integrate refugees into Scotland's communities. And I certainly share the vision set out by John Wilkes, Chief Executive of the Scottish Re Refugee Council, when he said, our vision is for a Scotland in which all people seeking refugee protection are welcome and where they are protected, find safety and support, have their human rights and dignity respected and are able to achieve their full potential in their new communities. We should commend the excellent work of local authorities and third sector organisations in supporting individuals and families seeking asylum in Scotland. Their work means that those seeking safety and a place to start their lives again, free from fear and persecution, are able to access the things which many of us take for granted, like housing and education. But of course, the picture is not perfect. The report highlights that 96% of refugees experience homelessness at some point, and that there needs to be greater, more flexible ESS, ESOL, that's English for speakers of other languages provision, for women with, fa with families. Let us be in no doubt that the Scottish Government already has a duty to ensure that individuals and families joining us here in Scotland have these things. These are very basic human rights. So I do reject the idea that independence is a magic pill to a better system, or that the UK arrangement in place at the moment is cold and compassionless. The system is not perfect, but progress has been made. Paul Doris. I'm not wishing to interject on the subject of independence, but just in relation to some of the responsibilities the Scottish Government currently has, housing would be a core responsibility for this chamber, but there are certain restrictions in the Scottish Government, and I've made representations to Margaret Burgess's <laughs> housing minister in relation to the quality of housing of asylum seekers and refugees, but this place does not have power over that. Do you agree that maybe that's something that could be looked at in terms of housing standards for asylum seekers and refugees in Scotland? Alison I McKenna. suppose what I despair of is the constant negativity from the SNP, which is always looking at what they can't do instead of looking at what they can do. And there's no doubt that there's plenty of scope uh, within devolved responsibility to improve the system. The Liberal Democrats were the only party at the last general election to campaign to end child detention. 7, 000, over 7,000 children were locked up in Labour's last five years, an average of almost four children a day. And we committed to ending that course of action, and we have delivered on that commitment. The new pre-departure accommodation at Cedars at Gatwick was designed and is operating in conjunction with Bernardo's and is used only as a last resort. Um, on the advice of an independent panel of child welfare experts, after all voluntary returns options have failed, and at the most, it can only accommodate nine families at a time in self-contained apartments. It offers the maximum freedom of movement and privacy within an unobtrusive secure perimeter with welfare services provided by Barnardo's. And the name CEDAR stands for the principles that staff will work to, the kind that we could sign up to compassion, empathy, dignity, approachability, respect and support. Yes, certainly. Minister. Uh, thank Alison McInnes for the intervention. It's the same question that I asked uh, Jamie McGregor, I wonder if she has an opinion then of whether or not Yarlswood, uh, somewhere that uh, I will read a testament later on that has been described as horrendous, uh, as, a, as a, not a detention centre, it was described by one refugee as a persecution centre. And I wonder whether or not she thinks that's a suitable place for children from Scotland of asylum seekers to be detained as they currently are. 
Children, um, whatever Alison they come McKinnis. from, ought not to be detained unless it's a very, very last resort. And we have seen um, a, a change, a significant change in the whole procedure, and it is a very last resort um, under a, an ensured return process that um, children will be held at Cedars and Gatwick um, for no longer than 72 hours. And it could not be further in look or feel from an immigration removal centre um, to what was there in the past. And the use of CEDARS is the exception. The aim is to encourage and support families to leave voluntarily without the need for enforcement actions. Now, we've made progress, but undoubtedly there is much more work to do at both a UK level and within Scotland, because it still takes too long to reach a decision on many asylum cases, and too many people face homelessness. We must continue our proud tradition of providing safe haven to those fleeing war and terror. And we must have a system which recognises the trauma which individuals have faced and which is resolute that their future will be brighter. But in getting there, there is a journey and a constant evolution of policy and practice to meet the new challenges. And I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And before I call Graham Pearson, I want to inform the Chamber and indeed all the open debate speakers that I can give you all uh, five minutes or thereby in the open debate. Mr Pearson, up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister alluded in his speech opening uh, this debate uh, the tremor, the tragedy and the fear that's faced by many people who cross the globe uh, seeking asylum in a foreign country. Uh, and it has been acknowledged across the chamber that the United Kingdom, Britain, and within that, Scotland, has played its part very often in ensuring that those who would seek solace uh, are granted respite in our country. Uh, at that human level, uh, very often individuals within our community and communities themselves um, have shown by example the uh, support that they can offer uh, those who would arrive at our doorstep in dire need. And at that human level, we have seen some great examples of the support that's been offered. Unfortunately, as, as I go around doorsteps in the south of Scotland, I'm also met on the doorsteps by a resistance to that approach, some indicating that they fear that uh, asylum seekers or refugees uh, achieve better treatment, and some alleging that they've been used as cheap labour and thereby uh, resulting in either unemployment in an area or a fall in wage rates. It's a type of, of uh, misinformation which some political parties would utilise in order to create fear and jealousy in our communities. And the major task that's faced by the Minister and his government is to ensure that accurate information is out there in our communities in order to reject that kind of information which passes as fact and eventually becomes accepted wisdom eh, amongst some within our community. It, it does no service to Scotland and it makes the task of ensuring that those who would seek asylum in our, our country and those who would want to be acknowledged as refugees, it makes their task so much harder and it also makes it difficult for the authorities and others to deliver on behalf of those who need so much from us. Of course I will. Thank you. Dennis uh, Robertson. Uh, I thank the member for taking a brief intervention. Do you believe that the media also plays an important role in actually putting across factual information rather than misinformation that actually, um, I, I think, in some areas actually fuels uh, some of the, uh, I, I think the word would be hatred towards some of our asylum seekers and refugees? Graham Pearson. I'm grateful to the member for that intervention. I would acknowledge the part that can be played by the media, but all the more... Uh, strength uh, delivers to my argument that the government need to ensure that repeatedly ad nauseum the facts are put out there in the public domain in order that we understand exactly what, what is happening uh, in our various communities. In that context, I commend the work of the Scottish Refugee Council, uh, COSLA, the third sector, individuals across our various communities and the communities themselves for the work that is ongoing in improving 
the, the nature of the reception that uh, we offer to asylum seekers in our country and also the development through the stages of refugee and on to, one would hope, productive residents. Uh, the uh, introduction of a new Scots uh, material is to be welcomed and uh, Scottish Labour support uh, the, the motion from the government in that regard as we do support the amendment from the Lib Dems. On an institutional basis, the, there is an indication of £13.5 million has been given by uh, successive uh, Scottish governments to assess the uh, to uh, aid the integration uh, of asylum seekers and refugees into our communities. I think that in all truth, that's a modest sum of money over a 13-year period. And uh, no doubt the award of £2 million from the big lottery to the Scottish Refugee Council will come as a welcome benefit uh, in enabling them to do the work that they deliver on all our behalfs. Uh, it's well recognised that uh, the addition of asylum seekers over the generations, as the Minister said in his contribution, has benefited Scotland throughout the ages. And there's no doubt, too, that in asylum seekers coming here and attaining that refugee status, there is still great difficulty in the 28-day time frame that's expected to move asylum seekers from accommodation into mainstream, and also the ability of the universal credit system to deliver some kind of financial support. So, in closing, I would say there's a number of questions for the Minister. Can he give us assurances that some clarity of information will be forthcoming? Will he, as is absent from the document, uh, obtain accurate numbers in terms of asylum seekers and those who are refugees in our country in order that we know what we're dealing with? Will he commit to ensure that none of these categories of people will be taken advantage of by unscrupulous employee, employers who, who would seek to take advantage of their, their weakness. And I note he made comment of the card system that's utilised. The card system was brought into disrepute many decades ago when it was used in terms of social security. And what it did do was it placed those who needed to use these cards in a very weak situation at a point when they're vulnerable and often was discounted by unscrupulous shopkeepers who would not offer what was necessary but actually discount the value of those cards and evidence of that should be produced and utilised in order that we can get rid of them. Uh, it would also be helpful to know the numbers of employers who have been reported for taking advantage of those within the asylum and refugee community, number of gang masters who have been convicted in, in Scotland in that connection. And I would support any commitment that the government offers to local authorities, particularly in Glasgow, which I think we need to acknowledge have led the way in offering support in some very difficult circumstances. And I close by supporting the motion and the amendment from the Lib Dems. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And thank you, Mr Pearson. Uh, we now move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of five minutes or thereby, please. Now, McKelvey to be followed by Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. It's not often that you take part in a debate with the words asylum seekers and refugees and humane system in the same sentence. Um, and I wanted to focus on that issue of humanity and what that means. Um, about 13 years ago, um, I had a briefing when I was a unison steward from Margaret Wood of the Glasgow Campaign to welcome, welcome the refugees. And from that moment on, I was involved in that campaign. At the same time, the Scottish Refugee Council started raising awareness in this parliament, and I'm very proud of this parliament and this nation, for marking Refugee Week every year. One of the things that was drawn to my attention when I worked in social work in Glasgow was the checks that young people were put through to determine age, which, and I don't mean to be totally alarmist here, but would have put Nazi Germany to shame where they were measuring wrists, taking x-rays, checking dental work to determine a young person's age instead of just speaking to them and actually treating them as a human. Then we had the Glasgow girls, who I think we should all be very, very proud of, fondly 
known as Glasgow Girls and their campaign around Don Raids. And we witnessed on our tellies almost every night the people of Drumchapel, of Castle Milk, of Springburn, of Sight Hill standing up to UKBA detention vans and women in those areas being uh, presented with National Scottish Women of the Year awards. A different Glasgow, a Glasgow that is humane. Was the treatment of all of those people humane? Now that's the question. I want to turn to Dungavel. For many, many years, I have attended vigils in Dungavel run by the Justice and Peace organisations across Lanarkshire and Ayrshire. The detention of innocent kids in Dungavel was brought to my attention because they were put there next to some of the most notorious child tra traffickers in the world awaiting deportation. Now, is that humane? I don't think so. And one thing we should remember is these, these children are not criminals. And I have to say, I have to say to Alison McInnes that although the Lib Dems did end detention for children at Dungavel, they just get shipped to Yarlswood or Collinbrook or some of the others. And it's not a last resort. You could just go and listen to the testimony of the people that I know and they will tell you that is not a last resort. So what we've got is a UK government of all colours playing top trumps on who's the hardest on immigrants, who's the hardest on asylum seekers, who's the hardest on refugees. It makes me sick to my stomach for some of the things I have seen over the years. UK governments, successive UK governments, refusing to sign up to EU directives to protect people, whether it's asylum, whether it's men's violence against women or children, and whether it's trafficking, refusing to sign up to those directives. Then we have go-home vans and adverts. How disgusting. We have a UKBA, at the time, who would determine asylum status along with traffic status and deny that person that protection all in the one envelope. Disgusting, not humane. We have people who have been forced into destitution. Then we have the obscene pictures on our telly of Jackie Smith chartering a plane and rounding up women and children at Brand Street and Govan to send them back to war-torn DRC and tell them they're there, it'll be all right once you're home. Or we have the situation of young women from Moldova, who in a film that we viewed in this parliament last week, Nefarious Merchant of Souls, a young woman trafficked across Europe, horrific circumstances, brought to London, was saved by the Poppy Project, was denied asylum status, denied traffic status, and sent back to Moldova because they said she wasn't at risk. But when she got there, the traffickers caught up with her. They abused her, they beat her, and they'd done absolutely horrific things to her. A few months later, where was she? Back in London, trafficked back. Humane? No. An independent Scotland, for me, is one of the ways we can change this. We can have a humane system, a new model of asylum that separates immigration from people seeking sanctuary. Because one of the most disgusting things about this whole process is the way that people conflate both things and the process dehumanising the individuals involved. I want a system that has protection, that has compassion, that has dignity and has support. A Scottish asylum agency underpinned with all of those values based on human rights. Now that's humane. And that's the kind of Scotland I want to live in. Now, Colin Sandra White, to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I too would like to take the opportunity to welcome Scottish Refugee Week and the number of events taking place across Scotland to mark the occasion. I'd also like to congratulate all of those at Scottish Refugee Council for the work they've done in preparing what is the 14th Refugee Week Scotland programme, which, as they state, aims to celebrate both the warm welcome that Scots give to refugees seeking sanctuary from around the globe and the contribution. We must remember this contribution refugees make to our communities. I also want to thank the many individuals and groups such as Margaret Woods and others for the help and the support they have given to asylum seekers uh, throughout, throughout the very many years. Uh, for many years, as Christine McKelvey said, and I know others will say as well, uh, basically and have done, uh, you know, I've campaigned for the rights of uh, those seeking asylum because um, I really truly believe, and I think most people in this parliament do as well, that uh, we should be standing up for some of the most vulnerable people in our society, be they refugees, asylum seekers or anyone else in need of our help. And I make this uh, plea once again, and I've said it before to the Minister and many others as well, that we, we here in Scotland as MSPs 
be given the right from the Home Office to actually basically stand up and, and be able to serve our constituents, because that's what they are. And uh, the Home Office continually uh, deny us that, that right. So I would make that plea once again. Uh, like others, I've um, stood outside Dungavel, I've attended rallies, I've visited people held in Dungavel, I've even had my fingerprints taken in Dungavel. I haven't had them back yet, but that's what goes on when you go to visit anyone in Dungavel. Uh, if you take a child, at that time I was visiting a family, you take a child a chocolate biscuit, they take the biscuit off them because it's wrapped in a, a certain wrapper and you can't give drinks, etc., etc. as well. And uh, I would say that basically Dungavel is a detention camp. And that's what I would always have called it and still do. A detention camp here in Scotland, but it's out with our control. And some of the stories that have come out of Dungavel in the time that we've been here have been truly shocking. And uh, the Catholic Church said that it's almost inconceivable that conditions such as we are now hearing about can exist in the 21st century democratic Scotland. They display an alarming, alarming disregard of any consideration for human dignity. Immigration is a reserved power, but maybe the time has come for a Scottish solution for humanitarian scandal on our soil. However, despite the outrage from church politicians and organisations across Scotland, little has changed under the UK system, which is clearly not for, fit for purpose. And that's why I, I'm a little bit concerned about uh, the amendments that came forward. If I just take them in, in turn, basically, uh, the Conservative amendment to say supports the work being done by the UK government to improve the system. It really is a kick in the teeth for the many people who are here just now still suffering under that system. And uh, they mentioned by the Lib Dems and Conservatives of the ending of children detained in Dungavel. Well, I think others have said that before me, and I'll go on to perhaps mention more on that. Now, let's not forget, uh, under the UK government, the infamous Go Home vans, with their clearly racist slogan. They were the brainchild of the Libs and the Tories in coalition together. Let's not forget the posters in Brand Street in Glasgow, which said, Is life here hard? Going home is simple. Another brainchild of the UK government, and that's when I turn to the Lib Dems, for the Lib Dems to cling on to the claim that they ended child detention at Dungavel, it really is simply ridiculous. Uh, it was, if I could just finish that, and I'll, I'll take an intervention. It was many groups and individuals who fought for many, many years to end this practice, and I wanted to go on to say that the practice actually isn't ended, but I'll take an intervention. Alison McInnes. Your remarks on the go home vans and your suggestion that somehow that, that was uh, anything to do with the Liberal Democrats, you will know that that scheme was roundly condemned by both my colleagues Nick Clegg and Vince Cable, and indeed myself signed the motion here in Parliament condemning them. Andrew White. I thank you, Alison, for that intervention. But you know what they say, uh, you go into bed with something, you've got to take out everything that comes from it. So your Lib Dem colleagues uh, went in a coalition with the, uh, the Conservatives down in Westminster and um, that's what they get for doing that. They could have stood up for themselves in other ways. Uh, now, even when the Lib Dems' uh, the pledge of Dungavel unravelled as quickly as your pledge to support free education, uh, we learned that children were still simply being transferred, as others have said, to other detention centres. And in some cases, and this is absolutely true, they're still being detained at Dungavel under certain circumstances. Absolutely. Now, Jamie McGregor says his party supports the work being done by the UK government. Now, does he mean the racist slogans in these vans that I mentioned earlier on, or his party's drive to appear more racist and xenophobic than UKIP to appeal to voters? I mean, that's what it seems like to me and many others. Uh, I'm not sure, but to say that the system is working is simply untrue. We know that the Home Office isn't fit for purpose and that refugee and asylum seekers are treated badly, whilst being used as scapegoats in many parts for any ills in society. And rather than hide from this, we need to look at how we can promote a fairer system, how we can foster trust and respect rather than mutual distrust. Uh, the New Scots Integrating Refugees in Scotland's Communities is a good starting place, but I think we have to recognise that it's very clear that the Home Office and the UKBA is certainly not fit for purpose. And the only way we'll be able to create a fairer and more inclusive refugee and asylum system is through independence and we having control over immigration. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. Now, Colin Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Bob Doris. Five minutes or thereby, please. The debate about this country's relationship with refugees and asylum seekers is too often distorted, too unfair and misleading, and many of the most common assumptions about asylum seekers and refugees are unrecognisable to those of us who have had first-hand experience of working with them. 
The Scottish Refugee Council have tried to challenge those assumptions by setting out simple, clearly written facts about the realities of asylum. I want to put some of those facts on the record today. 80% of the world's refugees live in the developing world. Many of them in refugee camps haven't been forcibly displaced. Africa, Asia and the Middle East host three quarters of the world's refugees. Europe hosts 16% and the United Kingdom just over 1%. It's true that asylum applications peaked in 20, 2002, but by 2010 they were down to a record low. In 2012 in the UK, less than a third of refugees who apply for asylum are successful, so we are no soft touch. Asylum seekers are not automatically entitled to council homes. There are asylum seekers in dispersed accommodation, but this is allocated by the Home Office. It is nearly always in hard-to-let properties, and the number of asylum seekers in dispersed accommodation is equivalent to just 0.05% of the population in Scotland. Home office rules actually prevent asylum seekers from working, and so they are dependent on state support, which can be as little as £5 per day. And according to Refugee Council research, asylum seekers do not come to the UK to claim benefits. In fact, most know nothing about our welfare system, and have no expectation that they could receive any financial support when they arrive. Presiding officer, I worked with asylum seekers before coming to the Parliament. I helped them get into training once their applications had been granted and they were able to look for work. They weren't scroungers, they weren't chancers, they weren't here to take advantage or abuse our hospitality. They were child soldiers who escaped African warlords. They were people looking for a home because the home they had was taken from them. They were grateful for what assistance they had received here and they were thankful for the opportunities they had found in a country where they were safe, where they could make a new life for themselves and where they could put destitution and persecution behind them. Those are the stories the public needs, needs to hear and those are the facts the official report must record. Before concluding, I also want to draw the Chamber's attention to the position of LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. The Kaleidoscope Trust's recent report reminded us that homosexuality is illegal in 41 of the Commonwealth's 53 member states, and it documented how just pernicious and malign the inequalities in some of those countries really are. Next month, athletes and visitors from around the world including those 41 countries, will come to Glasgow to celebrate the Commonwealth Games. We can send out a powerful message of hope by showing that gay athletes and LGBT people are welcome here in Scotland. And we can also make a practical difference by ensuring our asylum system treats LGBT people with dignity and respect. The review into intrusion, intrusive questioning of gay asylum seekers is welcome but we must also ask searching questions about a system which has seen LGBT people deported back to countries where they face persecution. Presiding officer, the aspiration the Scottish Government has set out in their motion, the desire for a more humane asylum system, is one that my Labour colleagues and I share. But let's be clear, to build support for a humane and dignified asylum system, we will have to take on all too common misconceptions. Let people hear the facts and make the case for a more tolerant, welcoming and understanding society. Thank you. Good. And I now call on Bob Doris to be followed by Claire Adamson. Five minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm, I'm delighted to be following what I thought was a, an excellent speech. Um, and it's actually in terms of common misconceptions that I was going to start my, my contribution. I think society is a, a lot more tolerant towards immigrants to, to these shores than, than actually shows up when you do attitude surveys. And I'd like to explain what I mean by that, presiding officer. When people use generic terms to describe floods of immigrants coming to the country, you break it down and you engage with people on the basics. So you talk about international students quite frankly, keeping our higher education system afloat by paying huge fees to come to this country. People <coughs> tend to say, well, of course, that's OK. 
when you explain to them that there's many Scot Scottish people and those across the UK taking benefits in other European countries in terms of staying there and made a life for themselves there and that actually when you look at those going to other European countries and those coming to Scotland and you deal with the facts, people tend to say, well, actually, that seems to be OK. And when you explain to them about asylum seekers and fleeing war-torn countries, as has been outlined, and I've got direct experience from my constituents in relation to that, then people I speak to tend to say, well, yes, that's OK. However, that's not what you tend to get in the mainstream press. So I actually think when the narrative is correct and deals with the facts in terms to immigration to these shores, the people of Scotland, I believe the people of the United Kingdom as well, are far more tolerant and inclusive than, than certain attitude surveys let on. And I think uh, we've all got a responsibility as politicians to show leadership and put some of the factual situation onto the record. Um, I want to share a, a very brief story with you in relation to a constituent of mine just now. Um, as one of those people people would just see and go, oh, there's another immigrant coming to our country. A young man called Akko was in my office the other day. Uh, I don't want to get into the details of his story. That's personal to him. But he was looking to be returned to Mosul. I don't think he'll be going there any time soon. And I've got a swathe of uh, uh, constituents that I'm representing in relation to a number of asylum and refugee cases Quite many of them are Kurds because of the connection I've got with the Kurdish community in Glasgow. And they're dependent on a court ruling, and apologies to Kurds and to the legal profession, called Back to Rashid, which I believe is in relation to, well, did you come, when did you come to the UK? Did you come to the UK from the Kurdish regional area, or did you come from the rest of Iraq? At what, at what, at what position was Saddam in power uh, before you came to the UK? And all of that is determining whether or not someone will be allowed to stay or not. The people I meet have been here for a long time, and this is just their home, quite frankly, and they're making an incredible contribution to our, to our, our country. So that's a flavour of the kind of people I meet in, in, in relation to when we talk about refugees and asylum seekers, but actually immigrants to our shores more generally. I also want to put on record in the time that I have in relation to the work that various other people do. Politicians talk about the good work other people do rather than the good work we necessarily do ourselves from time to time. So uh, I want to put on record the work that the police do in relation to this. And uh, I remember a man I first met when I became an MSP in 2007, uh, Constable Harry Falls, who's since retired, who was a community police officer in Sighthill, Glasgow, and the good work he did bringing communities together, it was exceptional. And an organisation my colleague uh, Patricia Ferguson will know very well in the Maryhill Integration Network and the fine job that they do in terms of inclusiveness and integration uh, in, in Glasgow, the area that, that I represent. I want to say a, a little bit about the Scottish Government strategy, New Scots integrating, re integrating refugees in Scotland's communities. Um, I think you could pick up that strategy and, and speak to that irrespective of your constitutional situation in relation to an independent Scotland or not. So there's no attempt to, to raise independence here. I think it's a set of principles that we'd all like to see in society in terms of uh, integrating people into our communities. And it's in that tone that I would like to address my mark. So in terms of the needs of dispersed asylum seekers, I have to say I hate the expression dispersed, but there we are. It talks about the long-term strategic planning of the dispersal of asylum seekers in Scotland is informed by the needs of asylum seekers and local communities leading to an increase in integration. Well, that get, well that's done well. It, 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 it really benefits a community. It wasn't always the case it was done particularly well, and I think things have improved in relation to Site Hill and Red Road from initial difficult, challenging situations, and I pay tribute to everyone that's been on board in relation to that. I think because my intervention to Alison McInnes was in housing, by the time I have left, maybe I should give a little bit of reference to, to, to housing. And what I'd like to say in relation to that is in relation to the, the housing contract that the UKBA has in relation to asylum seekers and refugees in, in Glasgow and Serco and or Orchard and Shipman and significant concerns raised by the Scottish Refugee Council and a number of my constituents and a, a cross party we've been working to to deal with that. I had made representations to Margaret Burgess in relation to what the Scottish Government could do given the, the housing standards and regulation. Well, there's really almost nothing, but I'll continue to press that to see what constructive uh, dialogue can be had in relation to that. But in housing, presiding officer, what I wanted to say is some of the social tensions in communities in relation to housing for asylum seekers and refugees are exactly the same as uh, in relation to homeless people. And that is you get a series of supported tenancies 
across the city of Glasgow, where you get a high turnover of individuals. And actually, that's not good for sustainable communities. What you have to do is turn some of those into permanent tenancies and embed these people into the hearts of their communities. And that's not how the system works. Presiding officer, thank you for indulging me, as always, sneaking an extra half minute into my contribution. But I, I thoroughly support the government uh, resolution here this afternoon. Many thanks. Now I call on Claire Adamson to be followed by Dr Elaine Murray. Five minutes or thereby, please. Presiding officer, I am often asked by the many young visitors to this parliament, what do I think is the best thing that the parliament has delivered for the people of Scotland? And I'm sure there are many answers from different MSPs um, across the chamber as to what that would be. But for me, it is the 2007 decision to extend education rights enjoyed by Scots domicile students to the children of asylum seekers. In the press release from, from that time, the government press release says children of asylum families are to have the same access to full-time, further and higher education as Scottish children under plans announced today. The then Education Secretary Fiona Hislop went on to say that from autumn, giving asylum children who had spent at least three years in Scottish schools the same access to Scottish as Scottish children to full-time and further higher education and also working with councils to implement HMIE recommendations for providing nursery places for three and four-year-old children of asylum families. And at that time, Ms Hislop said, the government believes that regardless of where they come from and why any child living in Scotland should receive, or why any child living in Scotland should receive care, protection and education. We recognise our responsibility for all children in Scotland and our obligations under the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. And this is the legislation that I choose because I think it was a commitment that was so important as it established Scotland as a country of compassion, of fairness and one that takes its international obligations to asylum seekers and refugees very, very seriously. In this debate about independence, we often say that Scotland has a unique set of values, one that distinguishes from choices made elsewhere in the UK. And there is no other area that is more easily demonstrates this than in the area of immigration and asylum. It is from these values that campaigns like the Glasgow Girls flourished. And the campaign, this campaign against Don Raids was an inspiration to our country. And these young women took, took their um, protests to the door of the Home Office to say that this is not wanted and not expected in Scotland. And it's their values that have developed policies such as the Scottish Guardian Service that is so important for unaccompanied young people, many of whom have been trafficked. And it's held as a model of excellence to the rest of the UK, as reported by the BBC in 2013. But I do believe that independence can make a huge change in this area. And the evidence given to the European Next General Relations Committee on the 15th of May, when we discuss independent citizenship and immigration, is very informative in this debate. Indeed, Gary Christie of the Scottish Refugee Council when talking about the proposals in the, in the White Paper, said we welcome the proposals in the White Paper to create a separate asylum agency. It is what we suggested should happen if Scotland voted yes. The rationale, beh rationale behind the proposal was about creating specialism and expertise and trying to move away from a culture of disbelief and respect, of which we could criticise quite a lot of the Home Office decision-making, to a culture of protection. What a great ambition and what a damning indictment of the current UK settlement that that is how asylum seekers are treated in our country. I was very welcome that the Minister mentioned that asylum seekers could contribute so much more to our communities if some of the, the legislation that prevents them from working, prevents them from taking a full part in their economy, was able to be removed. I was taught by a refugee in my degree course a very um, fond memories of Dr. Jose Munoz, who was a Chilean refugee. Not, he was a, a fantastic lecturer and an, a, a world expert on data modelling and databases. There was a great interest and pride that last year I read the reports about the Chileans giving thanks to Scotland for their welcome that they received when they came to this country. And to read the stories of the Cowdenbeath Miners Band piping the refugees into the town, a town that had fundraised, the miners themselves fundraised to help bring those refugees from across um, the Atlantic to Scotland. 
and the Chilean, ref the Chilean community was giving thanks to Scotland for that warm welcome, for the homes, for the, um, the welcome into their communities. And this is a Scotland that I recognise. It's not one that's driven by Daily Mail um, or, or tabloid um, journalism, um, fear and, and some of the other really damaging um, opinions that are coming from, from elsewhere in the UK. And I think this is the Scotland that we all must aspire to. Many pe As people have mentioned. Now, please, oh, yeah. many people have mentioned Dungavel, and um, again, they often sing Hamish Henderson's "Come Freedom, Come All Ye." And I hope Scotland will be a house where all the bairns of Adam will find breed, badly breed, and painted room. Yes. Many thanks. Um, call on Dr. Elaine Murray to be followed by James Dornan. Now up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Following on for uh, Claire Adamson's contribution, my tangential knowledge of the experience of refugee uh, refers to Hector Fuentes, who uh, came to this country in 1976, uh, having been expelled uh, from uh, Pinochet's Chile after three years of imprisonment, uh, during which time he was tortured both physically and psychologically. He was told uh, on more than one occasion that he was to face the firing squad, and that was purely for having left-wing political opinions. He uh, thought he was coming at Amnesty International campaign for many uh, of the Chilean uh, prisoners to be released. He thought he was going to Paris uh, and one grey morning found himself in Sheffield instead um, uh, with very little English. However, uh, and Claire has just said how the miners in Scotland supported and welcomed him. He was support and his comrades were supported and welcomed by the people of Sheffield too and he lived there for some period of time. Eventually he married my younger sister and uh, he has lived in this country, in the United Kingdom, for now for almost 40 years, contributing to our economy, a success story. I think there's one thing he still finds difficult, and that is the British winter weather. Uh, in advance of this debate, I read through the contributions of Lord Roberts and Baroness Lister doing debate on the immigration bill in the Lords on the 17th of March, and I had much sympathy for some of the points they were making. Baroness Lister argued, for example, that the time limit to barring asylum seekers from accessing the labour market should be reduced from 12 to 6 months. She didn't say it should go altogether, but she felt that that would reduce the danger of asylum seekers being forced into the illegal shadow labour market and being subject to totally unregulated exploitation and exposure to criminal elements involved in trafficking and other horrendous abuses. She also pointed out that the Joint Committee on Human Rights inquiry into the treatment of asylum seekers in 2007 considered that a number, in a number of cases this reached the European Convention on Human Rights Article 3 threshold for inhuman and degrading treatment. And that report stated that the policy of enforced destitution should cease, that the system of asylum seeker support was a confusing mess and that a coherent unified, simplified and accessible support, system of support for asylum seekers should be introduced. That ought to have happened and it hasn't. Jack McConnell yesterday argued that the UK could have a regionally flexible immigration policy which would recognise the issues are different in different parts of the country. We know that he piloted a form of this when he was First Minister through the Fresh Talent Initiative. Now, I don't know the detail of his proposals and how, whether he also imagined that extending to asylum, but I am attracted to the idea of a flexible UK policy because I think it would avoid some of the difficulties which could present themselves if an independent Scotland had a very different immigration policy. Yeah, briefly. I accept her point uh, about uh, Jack McConnell and the sincerity in trying to change this to somebody I have a great amount of respect for. Uh, does his example not actually show why the current devolution system just does not work? I mean, you had a Labour government in the UK, you had a Labour government here, of course, in the, in the Scottish government, but yet a Labour First Minister could not stop Don raids, for example, from happening, or fresh talent from being... Yeah. Uh, Dr. Murray. My argument, I think, is, is that we can achieve some of this through devolution, and I think that's actually Jack McConnell's argument. The problem for an independent Scotland, as far as I could see, is if uh, it had a very different asylum and immigration policy to the rest of the United Kingdom, and that, the rest of that, the United Kingdom is a more right-wing government, a government which might have UKIP involved in it, then you could have Scotland being seen to be a backdoor into the rest of the United Kingdom, and you could see the rest of the United Kingdom setting up border control, and that does worry me. I think, actually, we need to look 
uh, more widely political uh, instability, war, climate change, na na natural disaster, uh, or are force across the globe are forcing people out of their own lands. And I think we have to have some form of international response in terms of asylum seekers. Rather than just looking at a, at a small nation, I think we actually have to tackle it on an international basis. The other issue I wanted to t touch also is public attitudes towards asylum and immigration, because I think sometimes that we are a little bit complacent uh, about views in Scotland. I was shocked, I have to say, uh, during the European elections when over 13% of the voters in Dumfries and Galloway voted for UKIP and actually average out across the south of Scotland is around 11% of voters voting for UKIP. If that was replicated, and it won't hopefully in 2016, that could mean that we had people from UKIP actually in this parliament. And we also know from, and I know what, I heard what Bob Dorr said uh, about social attitudes, but we, uh, a recent social attitudes survey uh, said that 60% of Scottish residents thought immigration should re reduce. Now, that, that worries me that there's still those, those views there. And I do th think, although, and I am supportive of the government's motion today, there is a lot more that we can do and that we must do to counter the negative stories, which, quite frankly, are perpetrated, and we all know who's doing it. They're perpetrated by certain sections of the national media. They are poisonous. Uh, and we should all be doing what we can to, to uh, counteract the, close, uh, uh, the, the, the view of asylum seekers which has been perpetrated out there. Many, many thanks. I now call on James Dornan to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Up to five minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Glasgow, Scotland's greatest city, is a city built on immigrants. Many folk from Ireland, from Italy, from the Indian subcontinent, from countries across Africa and the rest of Europe and everywhere in between chose to call Glasgow home. And they've helped shape the city across many generations. My own constituency of Cathcart is one of the most diverse, multi-faiths and multi-ethnic parts of Scotland, and it's a better place for it. We see this through the setting up of a range of networks that bring people together, like the Greater Pollock Integration Network, based in my constituency, which helps ensure that asylum seekers are housed adequately, represented properly, able to feed and clothe their families, and to defend their inalienable human rights, as well as becoming an important part of the local community. It's also highlighted by the many voices who shared my dismay at the Home Office rhetoric in their Go Home campaigns, including the poster campaigns which have been talked about earlier on, which were highlighted in UKBA centres in Glasgow and London. As Sandra White, I think it was, said, to use such phrases as, is life here hard, going home is simple, and this plane can take you home, we can book your tickets, is not the actions of a humane organisation. A central truth seems to have been forgotten by the Home Office throughout these campaigns. For many people having to visit these centres on a regular basis, going home is simply not an option, regardless of how hard life may be for them here. This lack of thought or care to the well-being of people who have lost everything and had to seek refuge in a safer place is, in my view, the worst part of this campaign. I do not think that the impact that using the word home for people who equate home with unimaginable pain and suffering was ever a concern for the Home Office, who appear to know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. Thankfully, this, the weight of public opinion forced them into not extending the pilot. We should all be grateful for that. You would think, listening to the rhetoric of the Westminster parties, that the system is creaking under the vast weight of asylum seekers. This is just not so. The UK receives 8.4 of asylum applicants in the EU. The highest, Germany, gets 23.2, followed by France at 18.3%, and Sweden, with the same population as Scotland, gets 13.1% followed by Belgium, one-sixth of the UK population at 8.5%, and then the UK. Asylum seekers make up less than 0.5% of the population of Glasgow, where the vast majority of asylum seekers in Scotland live. If all the refugees and asylum seekers in Scotland gathered at Hamden Stadium, in my constituency, it would be less than 40% full. Presiding officer, one of the few motions that the SNP group and Labour group at Glasgow City Council have ever agreed on was the one put forward by my predecessor as group leader and councillor for Langside, councillor Susan Aitken, which is condemning the forced destitution of asylum seekers in Glasgow through changes to the provision of housing, mentioned earlier by Bob Doris. It noted the restrictions that have been placed on local authorities hampering their ability to provide help and assistance to failed asylum seekers. It called on the UKBA to change their policy to allow Glasgow to assist refugees in danger of destitution. To date, this cross-party call has not been heeded. And that perfectly encapsulates all that is wrong with the UKBA and our asylum system. Even when they are given the opportunity to make life better for people, when local authorities want the power and responsibility to help, they refuse to delegate those powers. 
The UK system would rather keep asylum seekers and refugees in a state of destitution than to give the power to where it, could be, it would help because this doesn't fit into the narrative that they are creating where we need to be strong in asylum and immigration, whatever the human cost. I suspect I speak for the majority of people in Scotland when I say that I don't want to encourage people to go home without any thought for the consequences. I don't want any truck with such a xenophobic, regressive campaign. I want to see an asylum system which is fair and just and humane and which takes each individual case on its own merits. I want a system that works for people and it says for as long as you're here, we will treat you with respect and dignity. And given the, rec the record and rhetoric of both Labour and Coalition over the last few generations, it's not going to happen under a Westminster government. Presiding officer, when the people of Scotland vote yes in three months, we can work to ensure that Scottish asylum agency that we will create to oversee asylum applications will be robust, fair and socially responsible and will clearly adhere to human rights, equality, principles and the right of law. I greatly look forward to the day when our hopes for a Scottish asylum system fit for Scotland's needs and the needs of those who need our support comes to fruition. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now call on Dennis Robertson. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, can I, can I first of all begin um, by associating myself, I think, with Margaret McCulloch's um, contribution this afternoon. I think it's a contribution that uh, did stick to the facts, uh, did put, I think, in context uh, the problem um, that is sometimes uh, overstated, uh, not just maybe in this chamber, but certainly in the press and in the wider context of Scottish society. The Minister, in his opening remarks, presiding officer, said, welcome. And we should be a country that is opening our doors, opening our hearts to the asylum seekers and people seeking uh, refugee status uh, in our country. I come from a constituency in Aberdeenshire West in the northeast of Scotland, a presiding officer, that probably doesn't see the, the number of people seeking asylum or refugee status than anywhere else in Scotland. That wasn't always the case, of course. And, and certainly in the past with uh, Aberdeen, uh, with uh, a harbour port, there was many people used to, in the merchant, sea, uh, merchant seamen, used to jump ship seeking asylum, uh, certainly back in the 80s and 90s. Aberdeen in the North East has always been, I believe, a place that welcomes people from all nations and all migrants from all parts of the world, presiding officer. I remember my very first encounter of someone from a different country. My aunt's husband, he came from Nigeria. She married someone from Lagos. And um, when he returned to Nigeria, eh, unfortunately he died as a reporter in the wars in Nigeria at that time. And um, eh, my my nephews at that time were deemed as different, but it wasn't from a, um, a, a, a sort of sense of uh, annoyance or a sense of uh, hatred or anything, just different. Because in the early 60s, there were very few people uh, uh, of a black min uh, ethnic minority within uh, the, the very small area where I lived. Presiding officer, Prior to this debate, I, I thought, I wonder what the process is. What is the actual process for someone that has undergone horrendous, perhaps horrendous difficulties in getting to these shores? And when they get here, what, who do they turn to? What is the first thought? Where do they go? When they want to seek asylum, what is the process? Now, we have a wonderful strategy, and, and I, I applaud the strategy put forward uh, by the Scottish Government, COSLA, and the third sector. But I wondered what that initial process was. And I thought, if I was an asylum seeker coming here, and I was fleeing, fleeing a country where I was in fear, not just of the military, but of the police, would I want to turn to the police and go to a police station and ask for asylum? And I thought, perhaps not. I thought, well, do I use modern technology? Do I maybe try and find out? I've just arrived in an area, where it be Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, and I think I've got access to the internet, perhaps. And I thought, I'll look at the council websites. And I did this within Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire. There's absolutely no reference to asylum seekers 
or people seeking refuge. Nothing. I contacted the council and asked, there's nothing on your website. Um, and we asked them to investigate. And they came back and said, you're right, there's nothing on our website. So if I was someone coming to this country and thinking, well, in fear of maybe going to the police because of past experience, who do I turn to? So I asked the minister in, in all sincerity, have we thought about that first step? That first step that people seeking asylum and refuge in this country, how do they embark on that first step? And if it is something as simple as putting something in, into the uh, internet system, uh, Google or whatever, but we need to ensure that people actually have that access to that first step, that very first process. In finishing, uh, presiding officer, can I, can I say that I condemn the card system? The Azure system is absolutely dreadful. We moved away from the voucher system because it removed people's dignity. It, gave them a, it stigmatized people. The card system does exactly that. It doesn't do anything else other than stigmatise the people that have the cars. It doesn't give them the freedom to go into a shop and buy what they need when they need it. It doesn't give them the freedom to maybe use public transport because it isn't accepted within public transport. Presiding officer, I believe that the strategy being put forward by the Scottish Government uh, uh, in collaboration with COSLA and the third sector is the right way to go, and I commend the motion of the Government. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to closing speeches, and I call on Alison McInnes uh, up to five minutes. Just remind members who have taken part in the debate they might wish to return to the chamber. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, it's clear that everyone who contributed to the debate this afternoon is driven by a strong desire to see a more compassionate, sensitive and fair system. We've all acknowledged the terrible events that, have, that drive people to flee their country and seek sanctuary here in Scotland. And we have too condemned the increasingly negative and hostile attitudes displayed by some, particularly some of the media, towards asylum seekers and refugees. Some members have referred to the Home Office's pilot Go Home campaign, and I don't blame them. I share the view that it was an offensive and discriminatory scheme. And I'm glad that voices around the United Kingdom, not only in Scotland, including those of my senior colleagues Nick Clegg and Vince Cable, halted that utterly disgraceful episode. What we've also heard today is a broad agreement on the kind of system we want to see in Scotland and indeed across the UK. It's one that's focused on individuals, one which is characterised by empathy and compassion. However, some speakers this afternoon would have us believe that this can be achieved in one swift, decisive move, a yes vote on the 18th of September. And I wholeheartedly reject that. The solutions are not as simple as constitutional change. Building a system which is transparent and accessible to those in genuine need, whilst ensuring that it is robust enough to, de to, to deter abuse, is not simple. But I believe that the UK Government has made progress towards building the kind of system that we want to see over the last four years. We have ended child detention at Dungavel. We have ensured that there is more support for families seeking asylum. And we have tried to reassure communities and the public that the system is compassionate to genuine cases, but that those who seek to abuse the system will be detected. Meeting the needs of those who are seeking a fresh start is not, as simple. It's not simple. It has consequences for all different policy areas. Health, education, housing, culture and the economy. And we need to recognise that this means that systems need to constantly evolve and that support services need to be ready and flexible enough to meet the ever-shifting needs and demands. The new Scots report is a welcome step in the right direction, advocating multi-agency working and the need for ongoing evaluation of what works to help integrate refugees into Scotland. Its focus on housing, education, employment and welfare will help to ensure the integration of the broad range of services necessary for those who want to build a new life in Scotland. The theme for Refugee Week Scotland this year is welcome. And we shouldn't underestimate the significance of local communities and the importance of a warm welcome. I know that communities across Scotland recognise the benefits which those seeking refuge bring. And others have spoken about that today. New skills, new cultural norms, Customs which we adopt and practices which we welcome as part of our multicultural society. We should be proud of our willingness to welcome refugees and continue to celebrate our joint future. But this is true of communities across the United Kingdom. 
Together, we have a proud history of accepting friends from countries where they would face persecution on the grounds of race, religion, political beliefs or sexuality. We have a proud history of supporting refugees seeking safety from countries ravaged by war, famine and drought. There is no doubt that we can and should do more to ensure that those seeking safety and protection have a warm welcome and the opportunity to get on in life. I believe that the best chance of achieving progress is as part of something bigger, as part of the United Kingdom. That does not mean that we should not celebrate and recognise some of the achievements and the challenges in Scotland as we have here today, but that as part of the UK, we can seek solutions to the challenges together and build a system of which we can all be proud, a system built on fairness, openness, compassion, mutual trust and respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Alex Johnston. Uh, five minutes, please, Mr Johnston. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. This has been a debate which at times has been simplistic and polarised and at other times has shed some light on a difficult situation which we all want to concern ourselves about. The truth is, however, that for many this debate has simply been an opportunity uh, to campaign once again for an independent Scotland often put forward by speakers who, uh, as ever they do, have confused the opinions of the Scottish National Party with those of the Scottish people. Let's try not to do that during the course of this debate. It is the case that we in the United Kingdom have an enormous uh, successful record of providing asylum for those who require it. Uh, over much of the, the last century, there have been examples of where this country has provided asylum for those fleeing from regimes uh, in Central Europe and from other parts of the world. We should be proud of that record and we should consider our future engagement with the asylum system uh, in regard with that history uh, take, being taken into regard. However, we do no service to anyone who relies on this system if we seek to confuse the process of seeking asylum uh, with that of e economic migration. And too many do confuse the two, not least those who seek to exploit the asylum system to achieve the economic migration goal. It is the case, of course, that the system we have in place uh, is one that is an evolution uh, of previous systems. It is ironic that some of the strongest speeches that have been given in this debate were given by speakers on the Labour backbenches. Nevertheless, the record of the Labour government on asylum was not one of which they can be proud. A process which contained delays so long that people were uh, essentially growing up in this country awaiting decisions only to be faced with that knock on the door and deportation uh, after having received the hospitality of this country for so long is not a system which we should be proud of. In fact, it would be described by many as cruel and unusual treatment. It is therefore the case that the asylum system in this country must pass some key tests. It must be able to distinguish between those who are entitled and those who are not. After all, we have recent experience of those who are guilty of persecution in their own countries, changing their identity, losing their identity and attempting to hide as asylum seekers in this and other countries. We have a duty to root them out and make sure they're not allowed to do that. We have a duty to ensure that those who seek asylum in this country are given our support while a decision is made. And if the decision is made that they shall be entitled to refugee status here in Britain, they should be given the full support of our government, our economy and our people. If, however, they are not, I think they're entitled to a quick decision and a quick return from whence they came. I think that is reasonable treatment. However, during the course of this uh, debate, we have, of course, deteriorated into some of the usual mudslinging which goes on. Although it was contradictory, we heard Sandra White uh, ask for us to foster uh, a relationship of trust and respect, but we also heard comparisons drawn with Nazi Germany. 
At other times during the course of this debate, we saw opportunities taken to throw in the usual digs at the current government. The suggestion that somehow the system of universal credit was disadvantaging uh, asylum seekers is one which I suspect uh, is well ahead uh, of any evidence to support that uh, conclusion. There has also been the, the usual attempt uh, by uh, many, but especially the government's backbenchers, to cast suspicions on the motives of anyone who questions or disagrees with the Scottish Government's position. We have also heard some concern about the press. Yes, there is a serious problem with uh, the expression of opinion in relation to asylum seekers and other immigration in certain parts of the press. It is unfortunate close, that, 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 that that action is taken as often as it is. But to suggest that the Members press last are wrong seconds. and the Scottish National Party is right is to fail to understand the critical and desperately important balance which we must achieve in terms of asylum seekers. I support the amendment in the name of Jamie McGregor. Many thanks. And I call on Patricia Ferguson. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the week when we celebrate Refugee Week Scotland 2014 with its theme of welcome, I am pleased to have the opportunity to close on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party in this de important debate. Labour acknowledges from the outset the positive contribution made by the Scottish Refugee Council to the lives of asylum seekers and refugees, as well as the important support afforded by local authorities and other third sector organisations to those who have fled violence and oppression. My party also recognises the significant work carried out in this policy area by governments of all political complexions at Holyrood. The particular focus of today's debate is signalled in its title, the need to fashion the most humane system possible that has, of course, as its aim, the swift integration of refugees as productive members of our society. Now, as colleagues are well aware, I'm a native of the city of Glasgow and immensely privileged to represent the constituency of Maryhill and Springburn, where so many asylum seekers have lived and have settled. And I'm extremely proud of the fact that at the turn of the last century, Glasgow City Council's Labour Administration took the decision to welcome asylum seeker families and to offer them refuge in my home city. And I'm privileged also to have been part of the Labour-led executive in the first two parliamentary diets that had, in cooperation with council colleagues, a good record in accommodating asylum seekers, assisting them in the process of integration, investing money in integration projects and language classes, and ensuring expert legal advice and, and representation was available to them. Again, practical measures such as the establishment of the Scottish Refugee Integration Forum, the introduction of measures to integrate asylum seekers' children into schools, and the core funding of the Scottish Refugee Council are policy decisions in which I think we can all take a measure of pride. And I also readily acknowledge that the Scottish Government since 2007 has followed this fundamentally progressive direction of travel. And while I mentioned the Scottish Refugee Council, presiding officer, I would just want to uh, put on record my regret that they no longer have the contract for offering advice to asylum seekers and refugees. I think that's a retrograde step. Mm -hmm. They had a great deal of expertise and trust, which is fundamental in this whole debate, and I regret that very much. Just as I regret the decision to take the contract from Why People for accommodating many of those, certainly within my constituency. And as I've said, within my own constituency, asylum seekers have played a very important role and are involved in much of the activity that goes on. And I would single out particularly the Maryhill Integration Network, established in 2001 and led so ably by Rema Sharifi, herself <coughs> once a refugee and someone whose determination and compassion shine through. The amount of work the network does is truly astounding from gardening to dance and photography <coughs> to food preparation, an organisation that is a joy to be involved with, and even more importantly, an organisation that makes a tremendous difference to the lives of all it touches, whether they are new Scots or old Scots. And for those who have perhaps had to leave their families behind, it offers them a surrogate family with support, assistance and entertainment too. And it's typical of the work done by so many other organisations too. 
However, presiding officer, none of us can be proud of the manner in which a number of families were forcibly evicted from their homes by immigration snatch squads in the so-called Don Raids. That caused justifiable public revulsion and led to the then Minister Malcolm Chisholm in a debate in September 2005 condemning the practice as absolutely appalling. My colleague Malcolm Chisholm was right to characterise that unacceptable practice in that way and the protocol agreed in March 2006 between the then First Minister Jack McConnell and the UK Government showed the direction of travel that needed to be taken in this sensitive area where devolved and reserved responsibilities overlap and where constructive cooperation between Holyrood and Westminster is paramount. But there still remains much to be done. Happy to, Mr Robertson. Mr Robertson. Yeah, I thank the member uh, for taking the brief intervention. Would the member welcome then uh, the, uh, the, the whole process of uh, asylum seekers being carried out in Glasgow for people in Scotland, rather than people having to go down to Croydon? Patricia Ferguson. I certainly would, and it was a source of great regret to many of us that no other local authority stepped up to the plate and offered to take part in that particular scheme. But perhaps if it were to be recreated, which unfortunately doesn't look likely, others might join in. But there still remains a great deal more to be, to be done. And for instance, as the Minister himself said, we still have the unacceptable situation where asylum seekers who are awaiting a decision on their claim for asylum are deprived of the ability to work. Now, there is no evidence to suggest that granting asylum seekers permission to work during that period leads to more asylum applications. Mm. And additionally, there is evidence to suggest that there is public support for allowing that to happen. And in my view, it would surely better aid the smooth integration of those who are allowed to stay. I believe that there is an unanswerable case to be made in favour of such a development, particularly if you look at the skill sets of many of the refugees who come to our country. They could make a productive contribution, as they so desperately want to, to the country that they have come to be involved with. Now, intergovernmental cooperation must be the approach adopted if we are to be able to build, as the motion states, a more humane, fair and holistic system. And I have to say, I thought Margaret McCulloch was absolutely right to identify the kind of intrusive and appalling investigation of LGBT people coming to our country. It shows at best a lack of understanding, but perhaps at worst, outright hostility to their concerns and their problems. And I'm very pleased that Labour is committed to treat immigration and asylum separately and is calling on the UK government to remove refugees from the net migration target. And I very much welcome the fact that a Labour government would make that policy pledge a reality in parallel with its commitments to combat exploitation in the field of immigration policy. And I look forward to seeing that come to fruition. Presiding officer, it would be remiss of me in a debate about asylum seekers and refugees, not to mention Syria at this time. Margaret McCulloch rightly identified that many other countries do much, much more Could than we do. Could you draw to a close, please? Thank you, presiding officer. And Syria is a case in point. The Lebanon has seen a 25% increase in its population because of asylum seekers from that country, and we could surely do more. Presiding officer, asylum seekers and refugees have proved themselves an asset, not a liability. And Scottish Labour believes with members across the chamber that they are our friends, not our enemies. They are our brothers and our sisters, and they are welcome here. Many thanks. I now call on Minister Humza Yousaf to wind up the debate on behalf of the Government. Minister, you have until five o'clock, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I think the uh, tone of the debate from uh, mostly across this chamber has been uh, fantastic, has been exemplary, and is exactly the type of debate and dignified tone which we'd want in such an important area of concern. All of us have rightly started by saying how proud we are uh, of Scotland's history of protecting those and giving sanctuary to those who've been seeking asylum from, as I said, even from the days back of the Great Hunger in Ireland right through to the modern day and age, and even to those um, difficult conflicts that are ongoing, such as the one that Patricia Ferguson mentions in relation to Syria. That's an issue that's close clearly 
to many members' hearts. It's one that's very close to my own heart. My mother uh, came here as an Asian uh, who was living in East Africa and Kenya at the time of the rise of nationalism and narrow ethnic nationalism through uh, Idi Amin, through Uganda and through uh, Kenya at the time of Jomo Kenyatta. And, uh, she had to leave and she came here, as many uh, Asians from East Africa uh, did. And so it's close to my heart, close to many other members' hearts too. Um, in terms of some of the points that were, were raised uh, during the, the debate, uh, presiding officer, we cannot accept uh, Jamie McGregor's motion uh, because the system, and while I accept it was inherited, was a bit of a shambles, to be polite. Uh, the system is not becoming any more efficient. Uh, the, home office, the Home Select Home Affairs Select Committee uh, suggests that um, uh, up to 2011, there's still a backlog, backlog of 32 thousand cases and uh, Jamie McGregor's motion suggests that the system is becoming fairer. Uh, that is a point I will also return to later on. I will also want to pay tribute to the many third sector organisations that all members of the Chamber uh, have mentioned. Scottish Refugee Council, again an exemplary organisation, but many others too. Uniting Nations uh, in Scotland is a new, new organisation. Uh, the International Women's uh, Strategy Group, uh, the Glasgow Girls who have been mentioned too, and also Police Scotland, which Bob Doris uh, mentioned as well. Uh, many of you may have seen the article featuring police officer Dario Dandre, uh, Dandrea, uh, who got a well-deserved award yesterday at the launch of Refugee Council for the work that he has done. Uh, many members here also mentioned uh, the media and the role that the media plays in terms of stigmatising refugees and stigmatising asylum seekers. I associate myself with all those remarks of those who uh, reject such practices. Uh, and we do have to speak up about the good stories in our own communities of the contribution that asylum seekers and refugees have made. I did an interview recently, just a couple of days ago, with STV uh, on, on the positive impact of refugees and asylum seekers. So there are some, some good media, as there are some bad. Politicians do, too, have an important responsibility to ensure that the tone is dignified, responsible, but also positive, just much like it has been today. And that is a challenge to my colleagues, particularly who have uh, members of parliament uh, in, in the House of Commons. Uh, all of us need to speak positively and challenge those misconceptions. Uh, James Dornan said that if all the asylum seekers in Scotland were put into the stadium, uh, the national stadium in his constituency, uh, they wouldn't even, it wouldn't even be 40% full. If you put the, those who are claiming asylum currently in Hamden Stadium, it wouldn't even be a tenth uh, full. Uh, and yet we have to be frank, as Graham Pearson quite rightly said in his contribution, that there are tensions on the doorstep. We knock enough doors to know that there are tensions. Uh, and there is racism in Scotland, let's not hide away from that. I've been at the brunt end of it, as many others may well have been. Uh, but I have to say I'm awfully proud of this country and for Scotland and for the Scottish people that whenever there's one idiot or one bigot who says that this is not your home to an asylum seeker or to a refugee, that there's a thousand more who say this is your home. And we're very proud of that uh, fact indeed. Um, it is not a huge vote winner. You're absolutely correct to say that. Uh, uh, those proposals that we put forward in terms of asylum uh, and refugees and how we would treat asylum seekers uh, positively, more humanely, more compassionately isn't a huge vote winner. People don't necessarily vote on governments because they are progressive towards asylum seekers. We do it because we believe it's the right thing to do. I'm very, very proud of the proposals in closing uh, well, in the last few five minutes that I have, uh, presiding officer, uh, that we've put forward in Scotland's future, the white paper. Uh, very, very proud that we'll separate asylum and immigration, something that's been welcomed, I think, from uh, the opposition uh, as well. Very proud of the fact that we'll say that housing should be provided by those, uh, either charity in the third sector or indeed by the local uh, authorities. And I must give credit to Glasgow City Council over the last 13, 14 years of the work that they have done. Uh, Alison McInnes said that we have responsibility for housing here that's devolved. But the problems that come with housing in the asylum system are because it's a private contractor, Circle, that has them. That contract doesn't belong to the Scottish Government to procure to tender. It belongs to the UK Government. So, look, there are some areas where we have responsibility, but by and large, those are with the UK Government. Uh, we want to give asylum seekers the right to work. Um, that will not encourage more economic migration. Uh, the mig uh, asylum seekers could do that. Uh, right now, what it will do is will take asylum seekers out of the black market. But more than that, it will allow them to be basically, it will humanise them, it will give them the dignity of work that they most certainly deserve. It also will tackle misconceptions that asylum seekers are scrounging uh, off the system or taking our benefits when actually they are working and contributing towards our society. Uh, in terms of uh, one of the, more, uh, one of the, the proposals that I'm especially proud of, is that of ending Dawn raids. The Glasgow girls who have been mentioned throughout this uh, debate 
uh, they are the best of our country. Uh, successive uh, governments have tried to end the practice of dawn raids, and Jack McConnell was an example of that. I don't doubt for a single minute Jack McConnell's sincerity. I very much respect that sincerity that he tried to end the practice of dawn raids. But surely this shows the absolute failure of devolution, that there you had a Labour First Minister appealing to a Labour UK government and Labour Prime Minister to end dawn raids, and yet he was humiliated by somebody of his own party and sent back from London to Scotland saying, well, dawn raids will continue. Regardless, that shows an absolute failure of devolution, not a success of devolution. Closing down Dungavel is also one of the proudest proposals in the white paper that I'm very, very uh, proud of, and I think that uh, pride is shared by members of this part of the chamber. Alison McInnes said child detention should only be a last resort. Uh, in truth, I think it should be no resort. I don't think it should be the first or it should be the last. I don't think we can ever, ever, ever justify the detention of children who have committed, of course, no crime uh, whatsoever. Uh, so I will be very, very proud of that uh, moment uh, when we close down Dungavel, indeed. Uh, We've talked about the fact that this year's Refugee Week uh, theme is welcome. Uh, and I'm very, very proud that that is the, the, the theme of welcoming. Uh, but I want to take issue with Jamie McGregor's motion where he talked about the system becoming fairer. I don't agree with that whatsoever. I don't think you can say the system is fairer when you have UKBA officers busting down somebody's door at 4.30 in the morning in terms of a dawn raid. I don't think you can say the system is fairer when you detain people in Dungavel or children down in Yarlswood. I don't think you can say the system is fairer when asylum seekers are left as destitute. I don't think it can be said it's fairer when they're given a plastic card, which is inhumane because they're not trusted with cash or with money. I don't think it's fairer when you refuse asylum seekers the right to work. And the uh, presiding officer uh, will be with immense pleasure uh, when we can treat and create a system uh, when we have the full powers, of course, of independence here in Scotland, that we can create a compassionate uh, and fairer system. And just to finally end on, presiding officer, uh, many of us as MSPs have managed through difficulty to get a victory uh, for those in the asylum-seeking uh, community and get them the status that they rightly deserve. And often we get thanks for that. But I don't think politicians often do what is right, and we don't thank those who have come to make Scotland uh, their new home. So let me take it here on behalf of the Scottish Government to thank every single refugee, thank them for the uh, culture that they've brought to Scotland, for the art they've brought to Scotland, for the music they've brought to Scotland. Thank them for the children who've helped to increase the educational attainment in our school. Uh, let me thank them, uh, for nonetheless, for making uh, Scotland your home. This is your home. You are the first and you are the last citizens uh, of Scotland, and you should be treated uh, as equally as anybody else. Thank you very much. And that concludes the debate on asylum seekers and refugees, the need to create a more humane system. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is decision time. And there are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first question is that motion 10268 in the name of Kenneth Gibson on a written agreement on the budget process be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion 10312 in the name of Stuart Stevenson on standing order rule changes budget process be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. And I wish to remind members that in relation to the debate on asylum seekers and refugees, if the amendment in the name of Jamie McGregor is agreed, the amendment in the name of Alison McInnes falls. And so the third question is that Amendment 10347.1 in the name of Jamie McGregor, which seeks to amend Motion Number 10347 in the name of Humza Yousaf on asylum seekers and refugees, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will now move to a vote. And members should cast their votes now, please.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 10347.1 in the name of Jamie McGregor is yes, 13, no, 100. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that Amendment 10347.2 in the name of Alison McInnes, which seeks to amend Motion No. 10347 in the name of Humza Yousaf on asylum seekers and refugees be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The amendment Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now, please. Result of the vote in Amendment No. 10347.2 in the name of Alison McInnes is yes, 50, no, 63. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Motion No. 10347 in the name of Humza Yousaf on asylum seekers and refugees be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a vote. Please cast your votes now. of the vote on motion number 10347 in the name of Humza Yousaf is yes, 94, no, 5. There were 13 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time and we will now move on to members' business and invite members who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly, please.